So you want to learn React, and naturally so. It is the most popular framework for building user interfaces. And I get it. You want to learn React, but you're not really sure where to start because after all, it is drastically different than traditional client-side development with just plain old JavaScript and libraries like jQuery. But don't worry, I've got you covered. Hi there, my name is Jeremy McPeak, and I invite you to spend just a few hours with me so that I can teach you all of the fundamentals that you need to know about React. We'll start at the very beginning with just the React JavaScript library and plain old JavaScript, you know, just to get your feet wet. But then we'll wade into the water with the basics of the React tool chain, and I'll teach you all of the rules of the JSX and how we use it with JavaScript to build components. Then I'll teach you about props. You can kind of think of them as function parameters, and you'll learn how to validate and provide default values for them. You'll learn how to handle DOM events and even create your own custom events so that you can listen for them inside of your components. And then I'll teach you the different ways to use React with forms, how to style your components with CSS modules, and use hooks within your components. We'll also use React Router to build a single page application so that by the end of this course, you will have the confidence and the know-how to build your own React powered apps. But first, if you want to create a professional website, then head over to Code Canyon, the marketplace for high quality JavaScript and PHP components, HTML5 and mobile templates, and so much more. The items at Code Canyon can help you easily add the functionality and eye popping visuals that you need to meet your business's goals. At Code Canyon, you will find a massive library that contains thousands of JavaScript and PHP components and almost 20,000 HTML and mobile templates. You will definitely find what you are looking for to take your site to the next level. The first thing that we are going to do in this course is spend a couple of lessons with just the React library. We're not going to be doing anything with JSX or transpiling or anything like that. Well, of course we will. But for these first couple of lessons, it's just going to be pure unadulterated JavaScript. So what we write is going to run natively in the browser without any help whatsoever. And later on, we will talk about the things that you will need in order to use JSX and things like that. But for right now, all you need is a code editor and you can use any code editor. If you have one that you like, feel free to use it. If you don't, I recommend Visual Studio Code because when it comes to working with JavaScript, there is none better than Visual Studio Code. It is cross-platform. There is a release for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So download whichever one that you need for your environment and you'll be ready to go. So let's get started by creating a new file. I'm gonna call this simply index.html. And if you are using Visual Studio Code, you can populate this file with some boilerplate markup by just typing an exclamation point, hitting tab, and then voila, you have your markup. And we want to reference the React JavaScript library, and we can do this by just using a CDN. So if you go to react.js.org, go to docs, and then over on the right-hand side, you're going to find a link for the CDN links. And it doesn't matter, there's two versions. There's the development version, and then the production version. You can use whichever one that you want. Since this is quote unquote development, we are going to use the development. So just copy those links, paste them into your document. And then all we need to do is just write some JavaScript. So let's have a script element. And inside what we want to do is build a user interface with JavaScript and React. Now to do that, we need to create some elements. So the React library gives us a method called create element, and we create our user interfaces by creating these elements. Now, this isn't technically an element. This is more or less a descriptor of an element. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, an element typically has some kind of type like a tag name, 
So in this case, let's create a div element. That is going to be the first thing that we pass to create element. Elements typically have some kind of attribute. So for the second argument that we pass to this create element, it's going to be an object. And the property names are going to be the names of the attributes that we want to provide for this element. So let's set an ID attribute to the value of message. And then we want to specify what this element is going to contain. Now, of course, not every element is going to contain anything. But in this case, it kind of makes sense to contain a message because that's what we gave its ID. So let's just have some text. We'll have our traditional hello world. Now, because we are creating this element, we want to assign this to a variable. So let's just call it hello world element. And then all we need to do is render this element so that we could see it inside of the browser. But to do that, we need a placeholder in the page so that we can tell React that we want to render this hello world element inside of a placeholder. So let's create a div element, an actual div element here. Let's give it an ID of app. And this is going to be our placeholder so that after we create this hello world element object, we are going to use React DOM. This is a library that is built specifically for working with the DOM, essentially. And we're going to call a method called create root, basically creating a root that we will then render our hello world element inside of. And we need to pass the actual DOM element object. So that is our div element that has the ID of app. That is the root of our application. And we want to render our hello world element. So there we go. By using React, we have created an element. It will be rendered as a div element that has an ID of message, and it's going to contain the content of hello world. So let's run that. And ideally we would be running this from a web server. However, we don't have one running right now, so we can just simply run this within the browser itself and everything should work. There we have our message, hello world. But remember that there are some very specific things about this. There should be a div element with an ID of message that contains this. So Let's inspect this so that we can see it inside of the document. So here we have that div with an idea of app. That is the root that we created. And then inside is the div element that we created with an idea of hello message and then the content of hello world. So that's great. Let's add some styling here. And one of the best ways to do that is with a CSS class. So let's add just a simple CSS class. We'll call it bold text and we'll set the font weight to simply bold. And to apply this class to our div element that we are creating, we simply just need to add this attribute to the object that we are passing to create element. So we can have class and then we will use our class name bold text. Now, first we're going to run this and we are going to see that it works, but class is a reserved word. But JavaScript is very quirky in that it allows you to use reserved words as property names in an object. I don't know why they haven't decided to go ahead and make that an error. It will definitely break some people's code, but personally, that's fine because it is rather confusing. But here you can see that our text in the browser is bold. If we look at the output, Put HTML, we can see that the class attribute is set on that div element and it is set to bold text. However, we don't want to use a reserved word because there will eventually hopefully be the day that this would be an error. The class word should only be used when creating a class. So instead of using class, we want to use class name. And we are going to see that it is the same result. The text in the browser is going to be bold. And then of course the HTML output is going to have a class attribute set to bold text. So even though right now we can get away with using just class, don't use class name. Now, of course, remember that this is JavaScript. It is case sensitive. So there is a difference between class name with an uppercase N 
and class name with a lowercase n. One is going to work, the other is not. Now, remember that I said that whenever we call this create element method, we aren't actually creating an element. We are creating an object that describes an element that logically doesn't make a whole lot of difference, at least from our perspective. But behind the scenes, it makes a world of difference. Because one of the beautiful things about React is that we no longer have to worry about manually changing and manipulating the DOM. React is going to do all of that for us based upon the changes that are made to the elements that we create and the data that they contain. That's kind of why it's called React. It is reacting to changes. But from our perspective, we don't really need to know that this hello world element object isn't an actual DOM element object. But if you want to know a little bit more as to how React works behind the scenes, it's kind of important there. So let's go back to the browser and let's open up the console. Let's refresh the page so that we can see this element object. You can see that well, it's just a JavaScript object. It has a type that you can see is div, but notice that there's not a property called attributes or anything like that. Instead, it's called props. And that is really what I should be calling that object that we passed to the create element method. Because here you can see the ID is set to message, the class name is set to bold text, and the children is also being added to this props object here. Now props are very special and we will talk about props in the next lesson because props are how we pass data to an element. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, let's assume that this message element that we've just created, this is some functionality that we want to reuse throughout our application. Now, of course, we can go ahead and we can just copy and paste this code, but we know that there are different ways of reusing code. We can write functions, we can write a class and create instances of that class. I mean, there's a lot of ways to reuse code. So in the next lesson, we are going to look at what are called components. It is essentially the way that we reuse functionality in our React applications. Components are the building blocks of React applications. And I like to think of components as functions because there are a lot of similarities between the two. Like for example, if you're building just a regular application, you're going to write some functions. Some of those functions you will reuse throughout your application. Some of them you will only use once and that's okay. The idea is that you've taken an application and broken it up into smaller functional pieces. And that makes your application easier to develop and maintain. That is exactly what components are for React. And the reason why I say I like to compare components to functions is that we can use a function to define a component. Now we can also use classes, but we'll talk about classes later. For right now, let's just focus on functions. So we have some functionality that we would basically want to reuse. We are displaying a message, but we want to be able to supply the message so that we can display anything that we want. So if we were writing just a normal function, it would look something like this. We could call it display message where we could pass in the message. And then we can just take what we have whenever we create this element. And this function is going to return that element so that uh, we can simply just call display message, pass in, hello world. Now that of course isn't going to work yet because we need to modify our function. So if we're going to create multiple elements, we don't need the ID. So let's get rid of that. And then as far as the text is concerned, we will simply just use the supplied message. So there we go. Let's go back to the browser. Let's refresh. We see the same result to prove that it's working. Let's change the text. Hello result. <laughs> And there we go. So we can see that this is working. If we look at the output, it is still giving us essentially the same thing. Of course, the ID is now gone. The text is going to be different because, well, that's what it does. But everything else was basically the same. So the end result is great. Now, we don't have a component yet. We have a function that with a few modifications can be a component. So the first thing is the name. A component is typically named a noun. So even if that component is going to do something like displaying a message, 
we typically just call it like message. And they begin with an uppercase. Now, of course, they don't have to. This is all convention. But if you're going to look at other people's code, this is typically what you are going to find. And if you want people to understand your code, I highly recommend that you follow the convention as well. So the first thing is the name. The second thing is the data that this function is going to accept. A component doesn't accept individual values like message. And if we had something else that we wanted to supply, no. Instead, what we have are called props. The props are essentially the object that we pass to create elements. So class name is a prop. ID was a prop. In this particular case, our message component is going to have a prop called message. And we access that by simply going props.message. So there we go. The last and probably the most important thing is that we return a React element because components return React elements. They do. If they don't, they're not a component. So we are already doing that. So we are good there. So then the question becomes, how do we use this? Do we just simply call it like a function? No, that would be nice, but no. Instead, what we have to do is create a message element. Because remember I said that a component has to return a React element? Well, this is essentially going to be an element that we will create, which means we have to use the create element method we specify that we want to create a message element. We are not calling this like a function. We are just using the name of the function and then we supply the props. So we would have our message of hello world and then that should be it. So let's go back to the browser. Let's refresh and we see hello world. Now let's take a look at the markup. Notice that it is still mostly the same we end up with just a div element that has our message. There's not a message element that is being rendered in the browser. That's because our message element is really just a component that creates this div element. So one way to think about a component is that it defines elements because that is essentially what we are doing. We are defining a message element that we are using within our application. So now the question is why, why would you do this? Because we took something that was much easier to use that display message function. And now we have to go through all this rigmarole. And the reason is very simple because we don't do this. We use tool chains. I mean, yes, you can technically create an application with just pure JavaScript and the React library, but you're going to have to write a lot of extra code. So by using the tool chain, our code could become something like this, to where we use actual elements inside of our JavaScript. And that looks very wrong, but that is what we do. And that makes this whole idea of components much easier to use. Now, of course, this is not going to work in the browser because no browser natively supports what's called JSX, which is what this is. This is JavaScript and XML. So what we are going to do in the next lesson is walk you through the things that you need to use React with JSX and all of the new features in JavaScript. That's what we refer to as the tool chain. When it comes to development tools, especially for client-side development, really the first thing that you need to download and install is Node.js. Now, it's not that you're going to be writing for Node, which you can absolutely do if you want to, but we install Node.js because it gives us access to what's called Node Package Manager, or we just call it NPM. And this is a tool that we use to manage the dependencies for our applications. And there are a lot of tools that are built for NPM. Like for example, we are going to use a tool called Create React App. And the purpose of this tool is to create a React application, but this is going to give us the entire tool chain that we need. So we don't need to install things individually and configure them and all of that stuff. 
This is going to give us a React application ready to go out of the box, ready for us to start developing. But it's not just for developing with React. NPM is an integral part of modern client-side development. So it makes sense to go ahead and install Node.js. So go to nodejs.org, download and install the LTS version. The version number doesn't necessarily mean anything for us, unless if you're going to actually develop applications on the Node platform. LTS stands for long-term support, which makes sense that you would want. So go ahead, download and install. It's a very straightforward installation. Just take the defaults and you will be good to go. Now, one other thing that I want to talk about is the React Developer Tools. This is an extension for Chrome and Chrome-based browsers. There's also a version for Firefox. And this isn't necessary, but it's a nice tool to have. So I recommend that you install it for your browser because we will be using it some in this course. And if you continue to use React within your applications, it is a very useful tool. All right, so after you have installed Node.js, you will want to go to the command line because NPM is a command line tool and we are going to run NPX. This is going to execute the Create React App tool. And then we need to specify the name of our React application. Let's, let's just call this React Fundamentals, press enter. And then this is going to uh, essentially create a new project for us with the latest versions of React and all of the other tools. So this says that it needs to install the following package, create React app, okay to proceed. And this might take a few minutes depending upon your connection and machine. But when it's done, it's going to tell you what you need to do. First of all, we need to CD into this new directory because it created our project in the directory that is named whatever name we gave it. And let's go ahead and fire up our code editor. And then back in the command line, we'll say npm start. This is going to start our application. So behind the scenes, what the tools are going to do is take the JavaScript and the JSX of our project, and it's going to what's called transpile it. Uh, transpiling is a lot like compiling. When you write applications with C or C++ and you compile your code, you are essentially translating your C and C++ code into what's called bytecode or machine code, something that the computer will understand and execute. Well, transpiling is very similar, except that in our case, it is taking our JavaScript and our JSX. It's converting that into JavaScript that the browser understands so that the browser will then execute that code. So there is a building process that has to take place. And then as you saw, it loaded it up in the browser and this is the result of that whole process. So in the next lesson, we are going to take a look at JSX because one of the whole reasons why you would want to use this tool chain is to use JSX within your applications. We use tool chains as we develop our applications so that we can use JavaScript features that browsers do not support because the tool chain will then transpile all of our fancy JavaScript into what the browser can understand. This means that we can write much more expressive code and dare I say code that's much easier to follow. So let's take a look at index.js. This is inside of the source folder, inside of the project that we created in the previous lesson. And you're going to see, well, this. The first few lines are importing things that are going to be used inside of this file. Now, these are modules. If you're not familiar with modules, that's okay. We will go over modules as we need to. Basically, these are individual files that export objects or functions or something that we might want to use inside of another file. So that is what these lines are doing. They are importing those things so that we can use them here. But on line seven, we see that we are creating the root and then we are rendering some things inside of the root. We have done that before. If we look at 
index HTML from earlier in this course, we create the root and then we render an element. And that is exactly what is being done, except that now we can use actual literal elements inside of our code, as opposed to using the React library to create an element object. So this is going to look very strange. We have XML inside of JavaScript. That's why it's called JSX. It's JavaScript and XML. And here the application is rendering an element called react.strict mode. Well, as that is rendered in the browser, there's really nothing that's rendered as far as the strict mode that is being used here as a development aid. This can help spot problematic code, especially legacy issues, which we aren't really going to have to worry about but it's a good idea to leave that in there. More importantly is the use of app. Now app is being imported on line four from app. Now this is app.js. We don't have to use the JS extension as we are importing JavaScript files. The reason is because one of the tools in this tool chain is called Webpack and it will know whether or not it needs to import the JavaScript file called app.js. So it's doing a little bit of magic behind the scenes that we don't have to worry about, but let's open up app.js. And despite the fact that there is some actual elements inside of this file, this is going to look somewhat familiar in that we have a function that is returning a react element. That is exactly what we did inside of our code. We have a function called message that returns a react element. So this app function is a component. It's not doing anything with any props that are supplied to it because really none are passed to app, but this is JavaScript and XML we can use literal XML elements inside of our code. So, this looks like HTML, but it's not, it is XML. And this is an important distinction because there are very big differences between the two. So the first thing that you need to be aware of is that this is XML. We have to follow XML rules. That means that every element has to be closed. So if the element can have children like the div element, it needs to have an opening tag and then a closing tag. If it doesn't have any children, it can be a self closing tag. But if the element doesn't have or can't have children like the image element here, then it needs to be a self closing tag. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that attribute values that are strings have to have double quotes. So here class name is being assigned the string value of app, the alt, attribute on the image is being assigned the string value of logo. Now I know that that looks rather obvious, but look at the source attribute on image. That is not a string. That is a JavaScript expression. So one thing to remember is that even though this is XML, this is JavaScript and XML. So we can have JavaScript directly inside of our markup. And whenever we want to use literal JavaScript inside of our markup, we put that inside of a pair of curly braces. So you can see that this is importing logo from logo.svg. So it is using that actual reference as the source here. And that's also one of the benefits of using a tool chain in that Webpack is loading all of this stuff as it is building our application and it is going to optimize it. So it'll optimize images, CSS, JavaScript, everything, but I'm getting off into the weeds here. So elements have to have an opening and closing tag, or they have to be self closing string values for attributes have to have double quotes. The next thing is that if it looks like an HTML element, it has to be in all lowercase. So this div element cannot begin with an uppercase D. It has to be all lowercase. And that brings us to something else. Remember that this is JavaScript. JavaScript is case sensitive. So there is a difference between div with an uppercase D and div with a lowercase D. So just about everything that we do inside of our files have to 
take that into account. But really that's easy to do because we're in JavaScript, it should be case sensitive anyway. The next thing to be aware of are JavaScript keywords like class. If you'll remember from earlier in this course, whenever we wanted to apply a CSS class to an element, we used the class name prop. We essentially do the same thing inside of our markup because class is a reserved JavaScript word. So the class attribute becomes class name. The for attribute, well, we have a for loop in JavaScript. So this becomes HTML4 inside of our markup. The next thing is that props, which are essentially attributes on our elements, use camel case. So class names, camel case. If we wanted to pass some other kind of prop, like if this was for displaying somebody's first name, it would be first name in camel case. And once again, it is case sensitive. And then finally, what we have here is an XML fragment and fragments. And then finally, what we have here is an XML fragment. A fragment can be only one element. Now it can contain children, just like this div element has a header that is its child. But the return statement for this app function can only return one element. It cannot return two elements. In fact, if we try to do this, not only is Visual Studio Code going to holler at you, which it's doing to me, but we're going to see an error inside of the browser. Adjacent JSX elements must be wrapped in an enclosing tag. So there you go. And really one last thing, and this is more convention than everything else, but notice the return statement. We return the element that is wrapped inside of a set of parentheses. Now we can get away by not using the parentheses, but remember that this is JavaScript. JavaScript has this feature of semicolon insertion. So at the end of this return statement, it's going to insert a semicolon and the app function is not going to return this div element. We can put the opening tag for the element on the same line as return, but then you know, our white space gets a little wonky. So what we end up doing is just wrapping our element with a set of parentheses. That way our markup is nice and aligned and it's a lot easier to read. So there we go. Those are the basic rules of JSX. And it's not really something that you can opt into. Well, of course, JSX is something you can opt into, but the rules themselves are not. We are bound to the rules of not just JavaScript, but XML. And one of the great things about that is if we mess up, <laughs> we're gonna find out eventually, either in the code editor or in the browser. Whenever I create a new project, I typically delete just about everything that comes in that new project for a variety of reasons. First of all, I like starting with a clean slate, but I also like practicing because programming is just like any other skill. And the more you practice, the better at it you become. So that's what we are going to start with in this lesson. Let's just delete everything inside of the source folder. And this will give us the opportunity to talk about some very important things about React because some of the things are hidden behind the scenes. Like for example, our application just seemed to work as is. And now it's definitely not because we don't have any code there, but the entry point for a React application is inside of the source folder and it is the index.js file. So let's go ahead and let's create that file because without it, our application is not going to work. And the first thing that we should do is import React. And the reason why we want to do this is because, well, this is the library. This gives us the things that we need to build our application. Sometimes we won't always import React. We might import some separate pieces of React, but we'll come to that at another time. So we want to import React. And in this particular case, we also want the React DOM. Because if you'll remember, we have to create the root of our application so that we can render our application inside of that root. So that is from react dom slash client. 
and we want to create that root. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just call this variable root and we will use the create root method. And we want to pass in the element that is going to serve as our root. And then we need to talk about where this element is. So let's go to the public folder and let's open up index.html. This is the template of our website. So whenever React or rather whenever the tool chain builds our application and then we view it inside of the browser, it is going to use this file, this index.html inside of the public folder as the template. And then it's going to inject all of the JavaScript that we write inside of this page. So right here inside of the body, there's this div with an ID of root. This is the root of our application. Now we can come in here and we can make some changes. In fact, if we wanted to, we could pull in some global assets. Like if we wanted to use bootstrap for our CSS framework, or if there were other resources that we might need, we could put that inside of this file here, or at least we could reference those things. But there's a lot of things that we also want to use NPM and Webpack and the tool chain to manage for us as well. So when it comes to something like Bootstrap, we can do that through NPM, which is probably something that we will do. So this is where the root is. So we want to specify that element. So we will use the ID of root, and then we want to render something. Now we don't have anything to render. So let's write something. Let's write a component. And this could be considered the main component of our application. And what you would typically find in other people's projects is this main component is called simply app. And if you remember from just a few moments ago, before we deleted everything inside of the source folder, that is what was here originally. There was this app component. Now you already know how to write a React component. It's going to be a function. We can have props, but I don't think we need props, at least right now. We can always add them later if we need to. And we want to return a React element. And we're going to use JSX. And you learned from the previous lesson that we typically wrap our JSX in a set of parentheses. This makes it a lot easier to maintain and read. In this particular case though, our markup is going to be very simple. We'll just have a div element that the text it will be hello world and of course it's very simple but it at least gets us started so we learned in the previous lesson that jsx is xml we have to follow the rules of xml which means that we can return a single element which we are doing our element has an opening tag and a closing tag and we've wrapped everything in a set of parentheses to make it a little bit easier so everything's great and good except that this is a JavaScript module. Now, if you're not familiar with JavaScript modules, it's very simple. It is simply another file and everything inside of that file is private by default. So we want to use this app component inside of our index.js. However, we can't because as it is right now, this app function is completely private. It is not accessible from outside of this file. So what we want to do is export that so that it can be used. And we can export things in a couple of different ways. The first way is to export default. This means that we are going to export one thing only, which in the case of our app component, that's all that we need, export default. Now you could see this written in a variety of different ways. In some projects, you'll see it written like this, where the function is defined first, and then it is exported. You might see it to where the function is in line with the export statement. And really it just depends upon the project that you're working in or the developers that you're working with. I am going to use this approach to where we define whatever it is that we want to export, and then we will export that. Now there's another way that we can export things from a module and that's just by using the export statement, but that is for exporting multiple things. And in this particular case, we don't need to export multiple things. So we'll just use export default. So with that done, we can go to the index file and we want to import app from app. Now we can use the JS extension 
or we can omit that. And then we want to use this component and we can do so very easily by just using app as an element. Remember from a couple of lessons ago that a component defines an element. That is exactly what we have here. We have a component called app that defines an app element. So we use it as an element. But remember though, that there was also the react.strict mode element. And we could use that. And whenever we go to the browser, we're going to see the result of our code. And the reason why we didn't have to refresh, or you might have to refresh, sometimes it varies, but the tool chain behind the scenes is watching the files. As changes are made, it's going to rebuild our application, and it should also refresh the page in the browser. It doesn't always work. Sometimes we do have to manually refresh, but in this particular case, it refreshed for us. So now we have our own starting point. In the next lesson, we are going to build out this app component. React was created for building user interfaces, and this changes the way that we develop web applications. Like for example, let's assume that we were building a static website. So let's look at index.html. If we had a static website, of course, all of the different pages within the website would need to have the same look and feel otherwise the same UI. So we would define that user interface through the markup inside of each one of those HTML files, which would be a nightmare. That is what you typically have to do with a static website. If we were using some kind of server-side technology, like if we had PHP and Laravel, or if we were using C Sharp and ASP.NET, they have tools to make it easier to build a cohesive web application, but still ultimately we would be defining the user interface for our application through HTML. So it would be directly inside of the HTML. With React, we define our UI as components. So essentially what we see in the browser is the result of building and using a lot of different components. So if we wanted to add a nav bar to our web application, we would write a nav bar component and we would be able to use that component throughout our entire application. And that's what we're going to do in this lesson. But first of all, I want the nav bar to look halfway decent. So I'm going to pull in Bootstrap because it has some built-in components that make it easy to use. These aren't React components. These are just Bootstrap components like the nav bar or alert boxes or, or things like that. So the first thing we want to do is install Bootstrap to our project. And we want to save this as a dependency. And the reason why we want to save it as a dependency is so that our project would then know that Bootstrap is a dependency. And if we ever needed to reinstall the project, then all we would have to do is say NPM and install, and it would install all of the dependencies. If we didn't save Bootstrap as a dependency, then our project wouldn't know that Bootstrap was being used. And so if we needed to reinstall it again, then Bootstrap would not be installed. But with it being saved, then we're good to go. Let's go ahead and start our application once again. This is going to, of course, build our application. It's going to fire up another tab for our browser, but when that pops up, we'll just ignore it for now. So now that we have Bootstrap as part of our project, we want to use it within our application. And if this was a conventional application, either a static website, or if we were using some kind of server side technology, we would typically add a link element to our markup where the href was either going to be the bootstrap CSS file on our server, or if we were going to reference a CDN or something like that. We essentially kind of do the same thing, except that we do it through JavaScript. And this is going to look very weird because we are going to be importing CSS through JavaScript, but this is essentially what we do. And I'm going to do this inside of index.js because this is going to import the CSS into the entire application so that we would be able to use Bootstrap's CSS classes anywhere. So to do that, we will simply just import Bootstrap that has a dist folder for distribution. 
we want CSS, and then there's bootstrap.min.css. And that is going to pull in the CSS into our application so that if we take a look at the browser now, we, well, let's go to the right tab. Um, well, this should have updated. Let's refresh and we can see that the style of that text just changed. And let's take a look at the source that is actually being sent to the browser. There's not a mention of any CSS. And that's one of the cool things about using the tool chain is that since we have Bootstrap as part of our project, it's being run through Webpack and it's being bundled into the rest of our application's code. So this bundle.js right here, this is the only JavaScript file inside of this web page. And if we take a look at this, then we're going to see some things that will look familiar uh, because this is the result of the tool chain taking all of our code. And now it's also pulling in the CSS from Bootstrap and it's injecting it into the HTML. So here we can see that this is app.js doesn't really look a whole lot like the code that we've written, but this is part of the idea of transpiling. It's taking the code that we've written and transpiling it into something that the browser can recognize. And here we can see our app component. It looks different than the code that we wrote, but once again, that's the nature of transpiling. All right, so now we have a reference to Bootstrap. Let's go to our app component and let's just make sure that everything's okay. We're gonna add a class or a CSS class to this div element and let's just use BG dark. That should change the background color to dark and it does, so we're good here. We are going to build another component. We're gonna call this navbar. So let's create a new file and we will have our function, we'll call it navbar. And let's go ahead and let's say that we're gonna have props because this is going to have a nav bar that will have the title of React Fundamentals, but then we might also want to provide a subtitle for the individual page. So we are going to return some markup here. We'll have the nav element, and there will be some boilerplate CSS classes necessary for using the nav bar component. Then we need a div element that will have a CSS class of container fluid. And then we will have the navbar branding, which according to the bootstrap documentation, we can have just a simple link. The CSS class is navbar brand, and we will have an href that won't take us anywhere. Then we will have our text of React fundamentals. And then this is where we can display our props. Now, remember that whenever we want to use actual JavaScript inside of our JSX, we surround it with a pair of curly braces and we will say props dots, and we'll just say that we will have a title prop. So that's going to be our nav bar. We of course need to export default nav bar, and we're going to use this inside of our app component because this should be present just about everywhere. So we want to import nav bar from the nav bar module, and then we want to use that. Uh, but remember, JSX, we have to return a single element from our components. So to start, we're gonna have a div element that's going to wrap around our nav bar as well as the content. And then we will see what that looks like in the browser. So with that change, we should be able to, there we go, we see React Fundamentals. Uh, let's provide a title for our nav bar let's say lots of components because that's essentially what we're going to have. And there we go. We can see that we are providing data to that component. Let's say though, however, that I don't really want to use a div element to surround the nav bar and then whatever content that we are going to display in the page because that could be disruptive as far as what's actually rendered. So if we inspect this, we will of course see a div element that wraps around the nav bar and the content. So here's that div, here's the nav bar, here's the content. So what we could use is called a fragment. This comes from React. So we would need to import React. And instead of using the div element here, we would use react.fragment. What this does 
is give us a single element that we can return, but nothing is going to be rendered in the browser as far as that element is concerned. So if we return back to the browser, we can see that we have root and then directly inside of root, we have nav and then we have the content. That's all well and good. We could simplify this a little bit by just importing fragment because fragment is exported individually as well. And the way that we do this is by using a pair of curly braces and then specifying the things that we want to import. So if you remember, whenever we export default, we can only export one thing like the nav bar. Well, the React module actually exports multiple things. So one of those things is simply fragment. So if we import just fragment, we're going to end up with the same result, but it makes our code a little bit easier to type out. Or we could do this. We could not import anything at all. And this is going to look a little weird, but this is probably the cleanest solution. We can have an empty element so that the opening tag is empty. There's nothing there. And then the closing tag is nothing there, but this essentially translates into a fragment. So if we go back and look, once again, we have the root. We don't have a div that's going to contain the nav and then the content. We have the nav as a direct child, as well as our content there. So I guess let's change the title here. This isn't lots of components. Let's say that this is using fragments. But one thing I'm noticing is that the content is being hidden. Uh, we have the nav bar, which is, of course, taking up the amount of space that it needs to. But as I hover over the content, we see that that is still being placed at the very top of the viewport. We want to push that down so that it is below our nav bar. And we can do that with CSS. So in the next lesson, we are going to add custom CSS to our index. In the previous lesson, we started to build a UI by adding a nav bar to our project. And this is a component. We called it navbar. It has a title prop so that we can change the text whenever we need to. In fact, let's go ahead and let's do that. So we are using that navbar component inside of app. And we talked about fragments in the previous lesson. In this lesson, we are going to very briefly talk about CSS and separating JavaScript and JSX, which sounds kind of weird because we are now in this environment where, well, it's JSX. Our JavaScript is intermingled with our markup, but there is some places where we can separate the two and you will learn about that in this lesson. So let's first of all talk about CSS because we have some content that is currently being hidden by the nav bar. And one of the easiest ways that we could fix this is just by adding some padding to the top of the body. So we want to add some CSS and we can do so in a couple of different ways. First of all, is to use the style prop. If you are using a what would normally be an HTML element, there is a style prop. However, it's not like the style attribute. Instead, it wants a JavaScript object where the properties are, of course, the CSS property names and then their values. And we will talk about that at a later time. For right now, though, we are just going to write some CSS inside of another file and import that because that's one of the easiest ways to add style, but it also behaves a little bit differently than what you might expect. Because whenever you import CSS, it is done so globally. So if we were to import a CSS file inside of our navbar component, it is not scoped to the navbar component. It would be globally accessible. So whatever CSS classes or rules are defined inside of that CSS file, we could use them throughout the project. So we are going to create a new file. And generally what you will see is the CSS file name is going to be the same name of the JavaScript file. So for me, it makes sense that what we are going to add would be considered global. Even though it is technically global, we would consider the rules that we are going to write as global. So for me, it makes sense to import this inside of index. There is no magic in the naming of these files. That's just kind of the convention. 
because it makes things a little bit easier to identify and find and maintain. So as far as the CSS that we're going to add, we're just going to add some padding to the top of the body and we're going to change the background color of BG Dark. So with that saved, all we need to do is import that inside of Index and then we will be good to go. So let's hop on over to the browser. This should automatically refresh and oh yeah, the content is using that BG Dark background, isn't it? So let's go to App and let's change that so that instead of BG Dark, let's go ahead and use Container Let's also change the class from container fluid to container inside of nav bar, just so that there's some breathing room between the left side of the screen and then the text that we have. So now we can see our content and that's great, but we're going to replace this. We are going to write a component that will display a list of things. We will supply that list as an array. So it's going to look like this. We'll just simply call the component list, and then we will supply two things. We will supply a title because we kind of want a heading for the list. And this is going to be just simply a list of guitars. And then we want to provide the items that we want to list. Now, this is going to be a JavaScript array. And we can define that right here if we wanted to. So we could have a strat and then a Les Paul. And then let's also have an explore. So we can define that right here. Or what we could do is define a variable inside of our component here. Uh, we could just call it guitars. And that would be our array. And then we would use this variable as the value that we pass for the items prop. Now, remember that since we want to use actual JavaScript inside of our JSX, we have to wrap that JavaScript with a pair of curly braces, just like we did in the previous lesson for the title prop in the nav bar. So it's the same idea. We are passing an actual JavaScript array to the items prop. So we need to use the syntax to make that happen. So this is essentially what we want. We just need to implement that so that it works. Let's go ahead and let's import this. Even though it doesn't exist, that's okay because we are going to create that right now. We'll call it simply just list.js and we will have our function that has our props. Uh, let's go ahead and let's define the return statement that's going to have our fragment as the return element because we're going to have two things. We'll have the heading or the title. So let's go ahead and let's output the title prop. And then we will have an unordered list. And let's go ahead and add in just a list item so that we can see something in the browser, just to make sure that everything works. And of course we want to export the list there. So with that done, we should be able to see our list and we do. So now we want to take that items prop and we want to essentially generate the list items. And this is where the idea of separating your JavaScript and your JSX comes into play, because while we could technically generate that right here inside of our JSX, we don't want to do that because in order to generate multiples of these LI elements, we essentially need to write some JavaScript code. We need to loop over the items array. So we want to separate our JavaScript from the JSX. So before the return statement, this is where we are going to have the code that's going to build our list of LI elements. Because when it comes to our JSX, we want that to be as declarative as possible. That's what makes it easy to read and understand and maintain. So how we do this is actually very simple. We're going to create a variable called items and we are going to use the items prop. And remember that this is an array. So we have all of the array methods at our disposal. We can use the map method to transform this array of strings into an array of React elements. So for our callback function, we'll just take that item and return a list item element where we will display that item. So it is somewhat mixing the JavaScript and JSX, but it's more along the lines of separating logic from the display or the view or whatever you want to call that. So what we end up with is an array of LI elements here that we can then use inside of our JSX. 
So whenever we go back to the browser, we should see our list of guitars, Strat, Les Paul, and Explore. So ultimately, it's a very simple concept. But it is something that you will do, especially as you write more complex components. In my mind, I think of, okay, I'm going to set up everything I need so that I can easily display that information. That's just how I mentally approach this. We write software to work with data. And whenever we use React to build our user interfaces, there becomes this very tight relationship between our application's data and the components that we use to display and work with that data. So in the next few lessons, we are going to be focusing on data and how we work with data and how changing data can affect our components. And in this, in the next lesson, we are going to specifically focus on props because props are the primary way that we provide data to our components. So in this lesson, we're going to go over some of the basics of props. Like for example, in order to pass data to a component, you use props. And the way that we define props is by using attributes. The prop name is the attribute name. And then of course the value is whatever value we assign that prop. And we can have as many props as we want. There really is no limit. And there's not a lot of hard and fast rules as far as how we name our props. But of course we can't use a JavaScript reserved word. And it's a good idea to use camel case. And just by specifying a prop, that is going to be data that is going to be passed to that component. Now the component doesn't have to use that prop. Like for example, we now have specified a text prop on our list component, but of course the list component doesn't do anything with that text prop. So as far as what we see in the browser, there's no change because we're not doing anything with that prop. And as I've said before, passing props is a lot like passing parameters to a function. In fact, let's do this. We can use our list component as a function because it is, after all, a function. And we could pass in, it has to be in the form of an object because, well, our function is expecting an object. But we can pass an object that contains our props. So we could have our title, which is going to be guitars. And then we of course need the items prop, which is going to be the guitars array. And then this is going to give us a result, which I've just called stuff. And we can use this inside of our JSX so that instead of actually using the component directly inside of the JSX, we are just referring to the result of calling that function and we get the same results. So I'm going to refresh and voila, it's the same thing. So it is easy to equate a component with a function. And whenever you start thinking in that mindset, then it becomes very simple as far as props are concerned, because we can pass any kind of value as an argument to a function. Therefore, we can pass any kind of value as a prop. So for example, whenever we pass data to our list component, our title prop is a string. Our items prop is an array. And if we wanted to pass a function, we could do that. For example, if we wanted to define what would essentially be an event on something, we could pass in a JavaScript function that would do something whenever that occurred. In fact, that's one of the ways that we can work with data, which we'll talk about at a later time. So we can essentially pass whatever we want to as a prop to our components, and we can pass as many props as we want to a component. Now, the last thing, and this is probably the most important, is that whenever you pass data as props to a component, inside of that component, the props are read only. So for example, inside of our app component, we define an array called guitars. We then pass that array to the items prop for our list component. So inside of list, the items prop is read only. We cannot change it. In fact, if we try to change it, we are going to get an error. Let's just assign a new array to items. And right off the bat, we can see that the browser doesn't like that. And we can look at the console and we will see the error cannot assign to read only property items of object. Now, the reason for this is because eventually we are going to get to the point where we're going to use what's called state. State is data that is essentially maintained inside of a component and React will 
automatically manipulate the DOM. It will re-render what is in the browser when that state changes. And props are essentially the mechanism that's used for updating components. So essentially that means that while we can't change the items prop inside of list, we can definitely change the array that is passed as the items prop to list. So eventually we are going to get to the point to where we can manipulate this guitars array. And whenever we do that, React is going to recognize that change and it's going to re-render the list component in the browser so that what we see in the browser is going to sync up with whatever data was changed inside of the app component. And this essentially means that data flows down in React. If you know anything about Angular, uh, you know that you can have a bi-directional binding, meaning that data can flow up or down. Well, React is not bi-directional, it is unidirectional. And it goes from top to bottom, from parent to child. Now, there are some things that we can use for a child to notify a parent that it needs to update something, like an event. But once again, we will talk about that at another time. So in the case of our project, as it is right now, the app component has an array called guitars, and we are passing that data on down to the list component so that it can display that. In fact, let's create another component. We'll call this list item because, well, why not? And this is going to essentially render an LI element. So we're not really getting a whole lot of functionality as far as this is concerned but this will give us the opportunity to see that uh, data just keeps flowing on down from parent to child and then from that child's child and then if we even need to go farther down from that child's down to its children so in this particular case we will return an li element where we will display the text for this item so we want to use this inside of list and uh, we also need to export that item <laughs> as well so uh let's do that we'll just export default list item so that inside of list we can build this list item that will have the text prop equal to the item that we have so now we have data originating inside of the app component flowing down to the list component that flows down even farther into the list item and of course, if we view this in the browser, everything looks as it should. In the next lesson, we are going to continue looking at props and you will learn how to validate incoming props within a component. When you pass data to a component, the component really doesn't care about the type of data that you've passed as the prop. And one of the ways that you can think about this is like a function. Have I mentioned that components are a lot like functions? I think I have. Well, when you call a function, you can pass anything to that function. Now, the function might not know how to work with whatever you pass to it, but you can pass anything to the function. The same is true for the component. So our list component has an items prop, and right now we are passing an array. But what happens if we pass a string? Well, let's give it a shot really doesn't matter what that string is, the application is not going to work. And the reason is very simple because even though we passed data to the items prop inside of the component, it's expecting an array. And if we take a look at the console, then we are going to see the actual error. Uh, it says props.items.map is not a function. And that's kind of explicit as to what the problem is, we can look at that error and we can definitely see, oh, okay, well, we passed an invalid value for the items prop. But sometimes the error is going to be vague. And then we have to stop whatever we're doing and we have to debug our application and try to find the problem. So one of the things that we can do to help ourselves find issues is to validate our props. Let me preface this by saying that this is not going to save your application from failing. It is, however, a useful tool for development so that as you run into issues related to props, they can help you spot those problems easier so that you can fix them and then get back to developing your application. So validating props is entirely optional. You don't have to do it because when it comes to actually running your application, you are at the mercy of 
the data that your application is actually working with. If there's an issue with the data itself, well, your application isn't going to work. So we are going to add some validation to our list component because we want to ensure that the items prop is an array. And the first thing that we are going to do is import prop types from prop types. Now, this is a package that was installed whenever we created our project with Create React App. If you have a project that was not created with Create React App, this is not going to be available to you. You have to install that using npm, which is quite simply the command npm install prop dash types. And you would want to save that. And prop types are going to give us the ability to validate our props. So we do that by adding a static property to our function or to our component called simply prop types. Now, notice the casing here. Prop types that we import has a capital P. The property on our component is a lowercase p. But this is going to be an object where the properties are the props that we want to validate. So in this case, it would be items. And then we use prop types that we imported. And this has some predefined values that we can use to validate. So our items needs to be an array. We will use prop types dot array. We could do the same thing for the title prop as well. So let's go ahead and let's say that title needs to be a string and that's it. So let's save that. Let's go to the browser and we are going to see the same error. Although let's do this. Let's clear out the console. Let's refresh the page so that we can get just the errors that we need. There is the error that we saw before that props.items.map is not a function, but let's scroll on up and we can see the first error failed prop type invalid prop items of type string supplied to list expected array. So, okay, let's fix that. Let's go back to app. Let's change that to our guitars array. And of course that is going to go away, or at least the application works. If we were to reload this, that particular error would go away, but let's pass something other than a string to the title prop. Let's pass in the numeric value of 10. Now the application is still going to work because the value of 10 can be coerced into a string. So that's fine, but we still get an error in the console. Failed prop type, invalid prop title of type number, supplied to list, expected string. So as I mentioned, it's not going to save your application from either not working or behaving incorrectly, or I, I guess I should say behaving unexpectedly, but it is going to give you an idea of what the problem is if it is related to props. Now, these two props are kind of important. The list needs to have a title. It also needs to have some items to list. Otherwise, what's the purpose of using the list? So really, we could also say that these are required by using the is required property. So props array is required, props string, is required. So now if we omit one of those, let's omit the items. And once again, it's not going to prevent our application from failing, but whenever we look at the errors, we can see that there's a failed prop type. The prop items is marked as required in list, but its value is undefined. So once again, the error itself is very clear and tells you what the problem is so that as you're developing your applications, it gives you a clear path as to what you need to do to fix it. Well, let's add another prop to our list. One that's going to serve as the background color for our title. And let's say that we only want one of two values. So we'll call this prop simply background. And the value that we will pass in is one of the colors from Bootstrap. So let's say that it can be either primary or secondary. Well, that of course means that we need to validate that, but prop types gives us the ability to do that. So we want to validate the background prop. We will use prop types and it has a method called one of you'll pass in an array that contains the values that this prop can be. So that's going to be primary 
and secondary so that if we pass anything else once again it's not going to prevent our application from working but we will get an error if we pass something other than one of these two values so if we pass in danger then of course whenever we look at this in the browser we can see that invalid prop background of value danger supplied to list blah 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 blah, blah. i kind of sound like a broken record, I keep repeating myself, but it is a useful tool. Now, what if you have a prop that is a custom object? It's not going to fit into the nice little neat box of an array or a string or number or Boolean or anything like that. Well, prop types can work for us as well. Uh, let's just call this special prop and we are going to use prop types and it has a method called shape. The idea being that you get to define the shape of the object so that if you pass something to special prop that doesn't match this particular shape, then it would be considered invalid. So if this had a name property, then we would use prop types to say that this was going to be a string. If we had an age, then that is a numeric value. So once again, we would specify that it is a number and so on and so forth. So that whenever we pass a value for this special prop, if it has a name property that's a string and an age property that's a number, then it of course passes validation. If it doesn't, then it fails. So this can be a very, very useful development tool. As I've said many times, it's not going to save your application from failing, but it can save you a lot of time finding bugs related to props. In the previous lesson, you learned how to validate your props using prop types. And one of the options was to mark a prop as required. Now, as you know, this is purely a development tool. This is not going to prevent your application from failing if for whatever reason we omit the items prop and the browser, it just fails. And in production, you want to avoid this scenario as much as possible because nothing is more frustrating than an application that doesn't work. So instead, a better option is to at least let your application work. The behavior might not necessarily be what you would expect or want, but a working application goes a long way towards lessening frustration on the user's part. So what we want to do then is provide a default value for our important props, like items in this case, and maybe for all of our props. It really depends upon the component and whether or not it needs those props. So we can provide a default value in a couple of different ways. The first would be to create a new variable inside of our list component. Let's just call this temp items. And we're going to use the good old shorthand syntax of a default value so that if items has a value, then it is going to be assigned to temp items. But if it is a falsy value, then we are going to assign it an empty array. And then instead of mapping over prop.items, we will map over temp items. That way our application will work. Um, no, it won't. We need props.items. This way our application will work. The behavior isn't necessarily going to be what we want because we want to see the list of guitars, but at least the application is working. So that's one way. The other way is to use something that's built into every component, and that is called default props. So we use it kind of like the prop types in that it needs to be a static property on our component itself. And it's just an object where the property names are the props and then their values are the default values. So here we can assign an empty array to items if items is omitted. And let's clear out the errors. Let's refresh the page and we can see that it still works. Now notice, however, that we do not get the error that we would expect to get because items is required. And that's because we have a default value. So it's kind of a toss up. Do you want a default value or do you want an error message telling that your application completely failed? because it didn't have an items prop. I would prefer to have a default prop. So let's do the same thing for background. Let's say that if we don't have a background, then let's set the default value to primary. And honestly, I don't know what the result is going to be here. So let's refresh. I would expect we would still get an error because the default value 
isn't going to change the fact that we supplied a background value of danger. So that makes sense. But if we omit the background prop, then we would see that error go away. And even though we aren't really doing anything there, uh, let's change that. So let's create a variable. We'll just call it CSS. And we want to use the CSS class of BG dash, and then whatever is our background prop. So that then for the class name for our H3 element, we could set that to our CSS variable. So now the defaults primary, we see primary. If we provide a different value for background, like for example, if we give it an incorrect value of danger, that's going to apply the danger color to our H3 element, but at least the application's working and we get the error that we would expect, saying that danger is not in the accepted list. But if we change that to secondary, then of course we see the secondary. So while prop validation might not necessarily be something that you want to do all of the time or any of the time, defining default props is something that you would probably want to do. If anything, it could prevent your application from catastrophically failing. And there's something to say about that. If all you want to do is display static content that never changes, then all you need is props. And there are some valid reasons why you would want to use React for static content. However, the whole reason why React exists is so that we can build interactive web applications so that when data changes, the UI will automatically re-render and update to be in sync with the data. And the mechanism that React uses to update our UI or re-render our components is called state. State is really nothing more than information that is managed by a component and that data can change throughout the lifetime of that component. So let's call this lesson getting started with state. And we aren't going to use our list in this lesson. We will revisit it later on to add some interactivity to it. For now, we are just going to create a new component called counter. It's going to be very simple. It's just going to count. But we can add some flexibility here so that we can have a starting point to count from. We could also specify what we want to count by so that if we want to count by twos, then we can supply that functionality. So let's start with just outputting the information that we get with our props. So first of all is going to be the start at prop, which makes sense. Let's add some text so that we know what this is. And let's do the same thing for the count by prop, because that makes sense as a name for that prop. And it would also be nice to have default values for these props. But let's first of all have a placeholder. Let's use an H4, and this is where the actual counter is going to go. We will, of course, change that later. So as far as our default props, let's have the start at B0. Let's have the count by B1. That kind of makes sense so that if we just drop in the counter component, then it will start counting like we would expect it to. And of course we need to export this, otherwise this whole exercise is going to be moot. So let's import this inside of our app and then we'll just drop it in inside of this div with a class name of container. So that if we hop on over to the browser, we see the UI that we would expect. We have our start at, we have the count by, and then the counter. So let's first of all think about how we would typically implement this. And I would do something like this. I'd have a variable simply called counter. We would initialize it with whatever was provided as the start at prop. And then I would use set interval. And this would call a function that would automatically update our counter with what was provided with the count by prop. And I would run that function every second. So that makes sense to me so that we could display simply the counter there. Perfectly logical. It's not going to work. Now we do see the number zero where our counter is, but <laughs> notice it's not counting. And the reason is very simple. We have to use state. We have to tell React that first of all, we want to use state, but also that our state is changing so that it will know that it needs to re-render our component. 
So the first thing we need to do is import a function called use state. This is from the React library. And this is what's called a hook because we are hooking into React's functionality. When function components were first introduced to React, they were stateless. You could supply props to them and they could display the information from those props, but that's it. They were very, very simple components. But as React evolved, these hooks were provided to hook into React's functionality, functionality that was normally found in components that were written as a class. So now we are getting to the point that we can write our components as functions and have the same functionality that we normally would if we wrote our component as a class. And function components are becoming the preferred way of writing components, which is one of the reasons why we focus primarily on function components. And we will talk about class components later. So we have this function called use state. And this is actually going to return an array that contains two things. The first is going to be whatever variable that we want to keep track of. So that's going to be our counter. The second thing is going to be a function that will set a new value for that counter. So whenever we want to update our counter, we call this set counter function. That's going to set a new value for counter. That's also going to tell React that, hey, you need to re-render this component. So we're going to call use state. We could pass in the initial value that we want to use for this counter, which is from our start app prop. Well, let's briefly talk about why I'm using a constant here as opposed to just a regular variable, because it might seem wrong to use a constant for a stateful variable, because the whole idea of having a stateful variable is so that it can be changed. And by making it constant, we are preventing any change from occurring. But this decision comes from the fact that we are using a function for our component. Because when React re-renders our component, it is going to call this counter function again. For every single time it re-renders the component, all of the code inside of the counter function is going to execute. So that means this counter variable is only going to exist for the life cycle of this function and changing its value isn't going to trigger React to re-render the component. So therefore it kind of makes sense to make it constant. And in fact, calling set counter really isn't going to change the value of this variable because calling set counter is going to tell React that it is time to re-render the component. So that is going to call the counter function again, which means that use state is going to call again, and it's going to provide the new value for the counter variable. So by using a constant here, I'm just protecting the value of counter as it is in this particular execution of the function. We're trying to avoid bugs and using a constant here gives us that ability. So with that explanation, I want us to rethink line six that we are calling set interval because anytime that this counter component is re-rendered, this function is going to execute, which means that it is going to call set interval again. Set interval is essentially an endless loop. I mean, we can close it by clearing the interval, but by calling set interval, we are saying that we want to execute this code every second until we explicitly stop it. So we don't want that because we're gonna end up with two competing loops. And in fact, if we leave the code like this, it's going to start to look glitchy. And I guess that we can go ahead and we can show that. So as far as our code is concerned, we can't modify our counter variable because it is a constant. And even if we did, React wouldn't know that it had changed and that it needs to update the component. So we're going to call set counter, and then we are going to provide the new value that we want our counter to have, which is going to be the current value plus whatever is the count by prop. And so by saving this, we can go to the browser and we can see that it is starting to count, but notice it's starting to kind of glitch here and there. And that is simply because we essentially have two loops going. And the more that this runs, the glitchier it's going to get, as you can see here. So we don't want to use clear interval here because that is essentially setting up yet another loop every time our component re-renders. 
So instead, it makes more sense to use a set timeout. So let's make that change. We'll go back to the browser. We need to do a hard refresh because we don't want any of the existing code to run. And so now we can see that it is running just fine. There's no glitching. There's really nothing that we need to worry about there. And so now that you know how we can use state to manage internal data and tell React to re-render our component, we need to add some interactivity. And the primary way that we do that is with events. Applications that have a graphical interface are primarily user-driven. We tend to react to whatever the user is doing. So if they click on something or if they type on the keyboard, we typically do something then. Now, of course, there are some times when we want to do something without user interaction. But for the most part, we typically react to whatever it is that the user is doing. And we do so by using events. So in this lesson, we are going to talk about events primarily for these built-in components, what looks like the HTML elements. Later on, we will talk about custom events because we can provide custom events for our own components. So instead of having this automatically updating counter, I want to provide the functionality so that we will have two buttons. Whenever we click on a button, it will increment the counter. And then whenever we click on another button, it will, well, it will do the opposite, decrement or whatever the opposite for increment is. So let's add those buttons. And this first button will be for counting up. Let's just use that terminology because that's a little bit easier to understand. And so our class is going to be the primary class. And then we will have simply the text of count up. Let's copy and paste for the count down. We'll use the danger class for this. And then we just need to set up our event handlers. Now, if you're familiar with DOM level zero events, those are the event handlers that we defined in our HTML. So that if we wanted to handle the click event, it would look something like this to where we would have on click and then we would have a string that would contain some JavaScript expression. It could be a function to execute or it could just be something else. Well, the idea in React is very similar, except that this isn't HTML, this is a React element, and more specifically, it's a React component, and components have props. Props are camel cased. So in the case of the on-click event, it is camel cased. It has to be camel cased. Remember, we are in JavaScript. This is JSX. It is case sensitive. Therefore, it's important to remember that props are camel cased. And then instead of supplying a string, we supply the JavaScript that we want to execute. So we need to use a pair of curly braces. And we could start off with something like this. It would be just a simple expression to where we essentially set the value for our counter plus what was provided for the count by. And we can essentially do the same thing for counting down, except that we would want to subtract the count by value. And so this should work. Let's comment out our set timeout because we don't want this to automatically go off. Let's refresh and then let's click on our count up. We are counting up. If we click on count down, we are counting down. So that's great and all. However, I'm not really wild about this particular syntax because when it comes to the markup, I want it to be as clear as possible. And if I have to decipher this mentally, then that's just extra time that I have to spend doing it because I'm lazy. So let's define two functions. One's going to be count up, which is going to essentially have this code to where we count up. So let's just cut that out and paste it. And then we will have the count down function, which will have a similar functionality. So let's once again, cut and paste. And then all we have to do whenever we set up the event handlers is just reference these functions. Now we don't want to execute them, so we're not going to have the set of parentheses after the function name. We just want to say that we are going to use this count up function to handle the click event for the count up button. And then we want the count down function for the count down button. So we can go to the browser, let's refresh. 
and we will see the same functionality. Now, one thing to remember is that since this is basically a DOM event, we get an event object. So if we need any kind of information from the event that occurred, we get one. It is automatically passed to the function that is handling the event. So let's write this out to the console so that you can see it. And it's going to have all of the information that would normally be there for a mouse event. So let's click on the count up. We have this synthetic base event. So we have the client X and Y. We have the page X and page Y. We have the screen X and screen Y. We have the target. That's usually what we are after. But when it comes to a mouse event, any one of these would be useful to us. Now, there are a lot of built-in events for these built-in components. Of course, there's on click, there's on mouse over, there's on mouse out, there's keyboard events, drag and drop events. I mean, there's a lot that we could go over, but we just don't have time to do. But they are typically named the same as their native DOM events. You will just want to use the camel cased name instead of all lowercase. And of course, you will find a link in the description for this lesson that will take you to the documentation for the built-in events. Now that we are working with state and we are manipulating it, especially through events, I think now is a good time to start talking about classes. Even though that functions are becoming the preferred way of writing components, there are still some times that you want to reach for a class. And unfortunately, there really is no hard and fast rule as to when to choose a class and when to choose a function. I am still of a mindset of using functions for more simple components. And that's just because functions were introduced as components for that explicit purpose. They were very, very simple. They did not have state. So for simple components, I tend to reach for a function. For more complex components, I tend to reach for a class. That's not necessarily right or wrong. That's just how I think of things. However, I do tend to think that the more complex your component is, the more suited for a class that it is. So what we are going to do in this lesson is rewrite our counter component as a class. So let's create a new file. Let's call it counter class. And I'm going to have these side by side so that we can see both of them at the same time. And the first thing that we should do inside of this file is import React. Because whenever we create a class, we are going to inherit from the component class, which is from React. So let's just call this counter. Even though the file name is counter class, we're still going to call this counter. And we want to extend react.component. Now, we can sometimes get away with this. Instead of importing React, we can just import component so that we don't have to reference React at all. Now, if you need to use React in other parts of the file, then yeah, you would want to import React. But for this case, we just need component and we are going to be fine. And really the first thing that you should do when you define your class is define the constructor because the props for this component are going to be passed to the constructor and you have to pass those props to the super class, which is the component class. So our counter class has a constructor that's going to receive the props. We're going to pass the props on to the component classes constructor so that it can initialize everything that we need to. And then inside of the constructor, we can also initialize some other things, like for example, our state. So inside of a class, first of all, we're going to use this a lot because, well, we are inside of a class and we have a property called state. This is an object where we store all of our state. It doesn't have to be simple values like our counter. It can be an object that has whatever shape that we need it to. It can be an array, it can be an array of arrays. Really doesn't matter. We can store anything in our state. But for this component, we just need our counter and we can go ahead and initialize that with the start at prop. And speaking of, let's go ahead and let's define the default props. So for the function component, default props was a static property on the function object itself. It's kind of similar for a class. We have a static property called default props, and it has essentially the same thing. 
So we can just copy and paste that code and we are going to be fine. The same is true for the prop types. So if we wanted to use prop types for prop validation, once again, we would have static prop types and then we would define the props and the types for those props. All right, so now we have these helper functions that handle our events. So these would essentially translate into methods in our class. So we can almost just lift these out of the function and paste them inside of the class. We do need to make a few syntax changes and we also need to address the code inside because we no longer have this set counter function. Instead, what we have inside of our class is a method called set state. And then we pass in an object that has the properties and the new values for those properties. So in this case, we would want to set our counter to the current value plus the count by props. But remember that we are inside of a class. So in order to access this information as far as our counter, as well as our props, we have to start with this. To get to our counter, we use our state and then counter. And in this case, we're going to increment by the count by props. So we say this dot props and then count by, and that will give us the same functionality. So we can copy this line of code and use it for the count down because all we need to do is change our addition to subtraction. And there we go. So we have our methods for handling the events. Now we just need to write the code that's going to render our component. So every component has a render method. This is the method that React executes in order to render and re-render our component. Now, when it comes to function components, the function itself is essentially the render method. As we talked about a couple of lessons ago, whenever React needs to re-render a function component, it executes that function. Well, the same is true for a class component, except that it holds on to the class object and it just calls the render method in order to re-render that component. So in a lot of ways, the render method on the class is going to be a little cleaner and leaner than a function component because we don't have to have all of this extra stuff because all this extra stuff is just part of the class. So what we can do is essentially take our return statement and let's just drop that into the render method. We do need, of course, to change our references here so that in order to get to our props, we have to use this in order to reference our counter. We have to use this dot state dot counter. And then in order to reference our count up and count down methods, this dot in front of them. So now let's just export this class and let's go to app.js and let's change the file name from counter to counter class. Let's go to the browser. Let's refresh so that it is completely loaded. Let's pull up the developer tools so that if we have any errors that we can immediately see them and let's click on one of the buttons. And lo and behold, we have an error, cannot read properties of undefined. And it tells us what it's trying to read, reading set state. Now, of course, the only times that we have used set state in our counter class is in the count up and count down methods. So when these are executing, this is undefined because that's exactly what it says, cannot read properties of undefined. So for the most part, everything about this component is working. Whenever we set up the click event handlers, we are specifying the methods, but they aren't executing within the context of our component. Instead, they are executing within the context of undefined. Now, this really isn't a React issue, although there are some other frameworks that have gotten around this particular issue, but this is a JavaScript issue. This really isn't anything new. and we know how to fix this particular problem. And we can do so in one of two ways. The first would be to wrap the calling of these methods inside of another function. And if we use an arrow function, then that means that this is going to reference the component object as opposed to undefined. So if we go back to the browser, let's just go ahead and refresh. And whenever we click on the buttons, we can see that that works. So that is one option. 
However, this option can get a little verbose, especially if you have a lot of events. And I know me personally, I want to have the least amount of code inside of my markup. So the other option is to essentially bind these methods to our component object. And we can do that inside of the constructor. So this is going to look a little wonky in that we are going to say that our count up method is equal to our count up method being bound to this. And we would do the same thing for the count down method. It looks weird, but it makes sense because we are essentially assigning our methods count up and count down a function object that is bound to this component instance. So if we go back to the browser, now we can, well, let's just do a refresh just to prove everything's working. Whenever we click on the buttons, we get the functionality that we would expect. Now, the great thing about this is that we have two ways that we can write a component. And with every new version of React, our function components become more and more capable like the class components. There still are a lot of developers that reach for a class when it comes to creating a component because that has been normal for them for many years. And in a lot of ways, a class gives you more flexibility. However, that also comes at the cost of, well, writing a lot more code, especially having to deal with this. But when it comes to working with state, I think a class makes it easier to work with state as opposed to a function component. So unfortunately, it really comes down to one, personal preference, and two, whether or not the class or the function fits the component. And the more experience you have developing React applications, the more you will be able to reach for whichever option the first time. The primary way that we get data from the user is through forms. And with just plain, ordinary vanilla JavaScript, working with forms can be a very tedious process. And unfortunately, with React, it can also be a very tedious process. But it really depends. There are two different approaches, and we're going to look at both of those. Now, form controls. And when I say form controls, I mean the elements that we would use within a form, like an input element or select or text area, those kind of things. A form control, as far as React is concerned, has its own built-in state. And the difference of how we approach working with forms really depends upon how we are going to work with that state. So in this lesson, we are going to look at something called controlled inputs, which is probably, well, there's no probably, it is the most tedious approach to working with forms. However, it's also considered the quote unquote correct approach. And we are not going to use our counter. We are going to use our list, but we're going to, take some time and we're going to convert the list into a class just for, first of all, the sake of practice, because as with every skill, practice, practice, practice makes you better at that particular skill. And two, we are going to be working with a more complex component. Now, the list is rather simple, yes. However, when we're done with it at the end of this lesson, it, it's not going to be so simple. And really, quite frankly, it's going to be the wrong approach. And the reason why I want to show you the wrong approach is because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I did and that everybody else did when starting with React, because there is a wrong way of doing it. And so uh, I think it's helpful for you to see that wrong way. So we want to import, first of all, component from React. We also need our list item, don't we? Uh, let's open up list so that we don't forget anything and we can just copy and paste as we need to. In fact, let's put the list on the right hand side because that will make this a little bit easier to manage here. So uh, we want to import the list item. I'm not necessarily concerned about the prop types, so we're going to leave those alone. And we want to define our class. We'll call it list. It's going to extend the component class. And from the previous lesson, you know that the first thing that we should do is define our constructor so that we can call super and then pass in the props. We're not going to worry about state just yet. And really the only other thing we need is the render method, which as you learned in the previous lesson is essentially the function in our function component. But of course we need to make a few changes because since we are going to be inside of a class, we need to use this all over the place. So 
props.items becomes this.props.items. Uh, the CSS was fun. Let's get rid of it. And then props.title becomes this.props.title. So with that change, we should be able to just specify the list class file. Let's go to the browser and export defaults. Yeah, um, I always forget the export statement, always. You would think that I would know that I need to do that because I always forget it, but no, that's not the case. And so here we have our list. So everything's working fine as far as the component is concerned. So now let's add in a form because we want to modify our list. So let's put this form inside of a div element. Let's add some padding to the top as well as the bottom. And we'll only have two elements. We'll have just a simple input element. This will be where we, of course, put in the guitar name that we want to add to the list. And then we will have a button. So the idea will be that we will enter the text, we'll click on the button, and by clicking on the button, we will then add that text or that guitar to our list. So uh, we'll have button and we'll use the primary class. And as far as the text is concerned, we can just have add guitar. So let's make sure that looks okay. It doesn't, but that's going to be okay. And we can close out the old list now. Now, without knowing anything else about what we need to do, we know without a doubt that we need to do something whenever we click on our button. So let's go ahead and let's define that on click event. We'll say that we have a method called simply handle click and we can go ahead and define that. Although we do need to say this dot handle click. So let's define that method. We need the event object because we want to prevent the default action of occurring, which is submitting the form. So we want to prevent that from occurring. And then we want to add the text to the array. Now we also know from the previous lesson that we need to do some trickery so that our handle click is going to execute within the context of our component class here. So let's do this inside of the constructor to where we say this dot handle click equals this handle click bind. So there we go. And now the question just becomes, how do we get the value from our input? And in just traditional JavaScript, we would probably assign this an ID so that we can get a reference to that element object so that we could get the value of the text box. And we will do something similar in a future lesson. For now though, we're going to use this as a controlled input. What that means is that we control this input through our code. The user does not control this input. So the first thing that we need is our state. So let's go ahead and let's define our state. And we want a value that we can use for our input element. So we could just call this new guitar. Let's initialize it as an empty string. And then we are going to set the value and we are going to use that new guitar from our state. Uh, let's put these attributes on multiple lines because that makes it a little bit easier to see. So by doing this, we can go back to the browser and I'm gonna start typing. Hopefully you can hear my keys. Nothing's happening because we are controlling this input. That means that not only are we providing the value to it, but we also have to update that value as well. And we do that with the on change event. So let's define that. And we'll just call this handle change. We need to define that method. We can copy our handle click and of course change the name, but we also need to do the binding in the constructor so that we can get around any issues with this. And so inside of handle change, we want to take the value from the input element, which we get from the event object. We get the target property followed by value. And we want to change our new guitar in our state. So we will call the set state method. We want to update new guitar with the value from the form field. And this is where the tedious part comes into play because whenever you use controlled inputs within your form, if you want to work with those values inside of your code, you have to, first of all, set the value of that input, which is typically something from state, 
And then you have to handle the on change event so that when the user types something into that field, it automatically updates the state, which then updates the value of the input. So if we go back to the browser and we type in here, we can see that we have a value. So now when it comes time to actually handling the click event on the button, we have the value that we want to use, which is that new guitar. So we can go ahead and we can grab that from our state, but then we need to update the items prop. Now, remember that props are read only. Not only do we not want to change the props, we can't change the props. So something we could do is add state here. We could add an items to our state, which we could go ahead and initialize as the items from our props so that whenever we click on our button, we get the new guitar from our state. And then we will set the state for our items where we are going to take the existing value and we want to spread those out into this new array. And then we want to add in the new guitar. Now that means inside of render, we need to change this from using our props. We want to use our state. Everything else though should be okay. So if we go to the browser and we type in flying V and we add that guitar, we can see that it is being added to our list. If we want a Vela, then once again, we can add that to our list. Uh, let's do this though. Whenever we click on the submit button and we add the new item to our array, let's clear out that text box. So we're going to set state again to where new guitar is an empty string. So now if we come back flying V, add guitar, there we go. We have a better experience already. So this works. However, this is not the best approach. In fact, I would say that this is the wrong approach to take uh, for a couple of reasons. For one, the list itself really should only be responsible for displaying the list. It should not be responsible for making changes to that list. And while in some circumstances you will want to take values from your props and use them in your state, in this particular case, I'd say that, no, we don't want to do that at all. So what we want to do then is what we typically refer to as lifting state. We want to lift the state out of this list component into the parent. But in this particular case, I don't even think we want to necessarily do that. I think we want our guitars listed here, but I think what we want to do is have another component. Uh, we could call it simply add item. This add item component would have our form and we could have our own on submit event so that when the user clicks on that button, we execute whatever was provided for on submit, which is essentially our own custom event, which will then modify our array. And then those changes will flow down through the list and the items props. So just to briefly recap on controlled inputs, a controlled input is one where we control that input element. We provide the value, and then we update that value with the on change event. And for every form control that we would want to interact with, we would have to do the same thing, which is why this is the tedious approach. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to the concept of controlled inputs. It's an input element or text area or select or anything that we would use inside of a form. They have their own built in state and we essentially control that state by providing the value for that component and then changing the value. And it is quite frankly, a tedious way of going about it, but it works and it is the quote unquote correct way of going about it. Now, in the midst of that, we also rewrote the list component to be a class, first of all, for practice, second of all, so that I could show you what not to do, because what we ended up doing is providing a form inside of the list component so that we could modify the list in the browser, which is a nice little feature to have. But really, we should be adopting the principle of single responsibility. All of our components should be responsible for one thing. So our list component should just be responsible for displaying the list and nothing else. But also part of this is because we've added state here 
where really the state shouldn't be inside of our list component. We need to lift it out into really the app component. And really we should write another component, which we could call add item, which will have our form and it will have a custom event called on submit. So that whenever we click on that submit button, it will provide whatever value was typed into the form field so that we can then update the guitars. So let's get started by writing that add item component. Now, since this is going to be dealing with state, I'm going to opt to use a class once again, because it's a good practice to do. And really we can take the code from our list class and we can use this as a basis. So really what, what, what are we practicing? I don't, I don't, nothing apparently uh there are of course a lot of things that we need to remove like for example we don't need the items in our state uh we need the handle click and the handle change and we don't need any of the markup that's going to display the list so we can get rid of that and we can get rid of line 34 where we create those items and really let's change our button text let's make this a prop because we want to make this generic so that we could use this really for anything. So we'll have a prop called button text. So we'll need to remember to provide that. Let's change the name of this to add item. And then let's export this so that I don't forget to do that. Finally. All right. So our states, our, our new guitar, let's call this new item. And we of course need to change that every other place, which thankfully Visual Studio Code highlights the usage of those identifiers so that we can easily spot where they're being used and then change them. And that should work. We do need to import this inside of app. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's not use our list class. Let's just use our list because that makes a lot more sense. The list is a very simple component. It is simply displaying our list of things. Now, of course, we'll probably get an error because we didn't supply anything for on submit. All right, so now when it comes to our custom event here, this is nothing more than a prop. That's all it is. We provide a function to this on submit so that inside of add item, all we have to do is execute that function. And we want to execute that inside of our handle click. That is whenever we are clicking on that button. So we still want to prevent default. Uh, we don't need to set state for items because we don't have items. We do want to set state for the new item because we want to clear out that text box, but we want to call the on submit function. We'll pass in the new item and really let's just get rid of that variable we don't need it and there we go that's it all a custom event is is a prop that you provide a function for and then inside of your component you just make sure to execute that function wherever you need to so very 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 simple all right so that should work for that let's go to our app component and we need to supply a function for on submit so the first thing that we can do is write a function we'll call it update guitars so that we will get the new guitar from that component and then we will modify the guitars array. So since we have that function, we can go ahead and specify that. Now the question becomes, how do we update our array? Now, remember that we want React to automatically re-render the page whenever we modify our list of guitars. We need to supply the button text. So let's do that. Uh, we'll call this add guitar. And so just changing the value of our array isn't going to tell React that it needs to re-render. It only re-renders when state changes. So we need to change this to state. So first of all, we need to import use state. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we will use state to create our guitars. We will have the function called set guitars, and we will go ahead and use this array as our initial value. I think eventually what we would want to do is just have an empty array so that we could add whatever items that we wanted to. And then inside of update guitars, all we would then need to do is call set guitars where we would set the new array. We would take the existing guitars array, but we need to spread that out. And then we would add the new guitar there and that should work. So let's give it a whirl. So if we want a flying V, 
we can add a flying V. If we want a Vela, we will add the Vela. If we want a Telecaster, we can add the Telecaster. Okay, so to recap, we lifted our state out of the list class component and kept it inside of app because really that's where it should be to begin with. The app component is supplying the information to the list so that list is responsible for just displaying the array of things. We wrote another component called add item that has a custom event on submit so that whenever the user types in something into the input element and then clicks on the button that executes our on submit event, it passes the new value to the event handler and then we update the state. Well, in the next lesson, we will talk about uncontrolled inputs. It's really easier to work with. However, it is a more controversial topic. Over the past couple of lessons, we have been using controlled inputs when working with a form because that is the preferred way of working with forms in React. The reason is because it uses that one-way communication, you know, from parent to child. And I know what you might be thinking, well, what about the communication from child to parent, because that's kind of what happened whenever the child executed the on submit prop. Yeah, but it's still a parent to child thing because the parent supplied the on submit prop to the child and all the child had to do was execute it, pass in the information that it was expecting and that's it. So all of the work was being done inside of the parent. So it's still that one way communication. Now, there are some issues with using controlled inputs. For one, it's a little tedious because if you have a large form, you have to manage the value and set up the on change event for every form control that you want to track. For large forms, that's going to take a while. But more importantly, there's just some things that you cannot do with controlled inputs. Like, for example, if you wanted to focus the text box after you add a guitar, you can't do that. Now, that might not seem like a big thing, but if we are writing software for data entry, we want to empower the users as much as possible so that they don't have to do a lot of tabbing to the correct form control or moving the mouse to provide focus. We just want them to type, enter, type, enter, type, enter, type, enter. We write software to empower users. So if we can't provide that functionality with controlled inputs, well, we can with uncontrolled inputs. So that is what we are going to look at in this lesson. I'm going to change the title here. I have not been doing that and I apologize for that. But at least for this lesson, we have uncontrolled inputs and we are gonna make a few changes because I want to use not just a text box, but I also want a select box so that we can provide the name of the guitar as well as the maker so that we have two pieces of information. We can work with two form controls. So this means our data that we are working with needs to change because it's no longer going to be just a simple string. We're going to have an object. And since our list and our list item components are generic and we are supplying information to those components, we are going to have generic properties for these objects. So the title is going to be the name of the guitar. Then we will have a text property that will be the maker. And this means we need to make a few changes inside of list because when we create these list items, we're using that text prop that doesn't make a whole lot of sense now. So we're going to change that to item. Let's also get rid of the CSS for our list title because that's just ugly. It was fun, but uh, let's move on. And then for our list item, this is going to be a little bit different because we still have a text prop, but it is just for text. But really it's not a prop. It is a property of our item prop. So we need that. And let's put the title inside of an H5. So we will have the title there and then we will just have the text underneath that. So in the browser, we shouldn't see that much of a difference. The text looks a little bit different, but that's good. So we can close that. I believe we can close our list. All we need to really do is focus on 
our add item. Okay, so when working with uncontrolled inputs, you do not use state. So our only state value was that new item. So we can just get rid of state altogether, which means that we can also get rid of the handle change because we aren't going to be needing to listen for the change event. We still need to be able to listen for the click event on our button because that is going to signal that we are ready to add that new information. So inside of handle click, since we don't have state, there's nothing to set. So we will get rid of that. We still need to execute our on submit prop though. So we will leave that. We don't have handle change at all. So we can get rid of that. And we don't need the value or the on change props for our input element. So that's great. Uh, I do want to add some markup here since we're going to have multiple fields. Uh, let's have some separation here. So we're going to have two div elements with some bottom margin, and we'll put the input element inside of one of those. And then we will put our select element inside of the other. And for right now, we're just going to hard code the data for our select element. Later on, we're going to emulate server communication, such as we would be contacting a server application to get our guitar makers so that we could then populate this. And we're gonna have a few options. The first is going to be empty because we don't necessarily need to specify the guitar maker because there are some guitars that aren't branded at all. And then we'll have three others. So our first one is gonna be PRS. The text will be PRS. In fact, the text for all of these are going to be the same as the values. So we will have PRS, Fender, and Gibson. And when that is done, we can go back to the browser. Let's make sure everything looks okay. Our button, or rather our select, needs to be inside of that div element. There we go there. All right, so now that should be okay. Uh, that's okay, that's better. All right, so now we just need to get the values of the input and the select elements whenever we click on our button. And we do that by using refs. We are going to create a reference for each one of those form controls so that we can get their values. It's going to be very reminiscent to just vanilla JavaScript, you know, where we would assign an ID attribute and then we would get that element by its ID and then get the value. It's very very similar. So to create a reference, we need access to React. So let's just import React. We'll change our class to extend react.component, and then we will create our references. We need two of them, one for each form field that we want to work with. So let's call the first one guitar name, and we're going to call react create ref, and we pass in null as the argument. This is going to create a reference for our input component and our select component. And we will assign these refs as well because each one of these components has a ref prop to where in the case of the input, that's going to be the guitar name. And for the select, that will be the guitar maker. And we will use these refs to get their appropriate values. And we will do that inside of handle click. So let's use the terminology that the app component is going to expect. So that is the title and the text. So the title is the guitar name. We use that guitar name ref. Now remember that we are inside of a component and we could have as many of these add item components inside of app that we want. So this means that we could have a lot of these input elements inside of the same page. So React needs to know which specific input component that we want, which is the current one. Makes perfect sense. And once we have the current one, we can get its value. We will essentially do the same thing for our select. So let's use the guitar maker We'll change the variable to text. And since we need an object now, we're going to pass in an object with the title and the text. So this is the basic functionality. This should work. Uh, let's add Vela, which is PRS. And we want to add something doesn't work. So let's take a look at the console and see what error we have. Cannot read properties of null reading value that is inside of add item 
line 19. So guitar maker current value. Let's highlight this. Okay, so that's good. That's good. Makers, that needs to be maker. All right, so now this should work. We want to add Vela, that's PRS, and we want to add. There we go. We can see that that was indeed added. Let's add the Telecaster, which is Fender, and add. So I'm using the keyboard now, and it would be nice to go ahead and focus this. Well, not just focus it, but let's also clear it out. It would be nice to also clear out the select box. So let's go back to our handle click and let's do just that. So after we call the on submit prop, we will first of all set the guitar name value to an empty string. Then let's call focus. And actually let's do this. Let's set the guitar name and the guitar maker's value to an empty string first. And then we will focus the guitar name that way. We don't run into anything weird. I mean, we shouldn't have anyway, but you never know. So let's do a refresh, start completely over. Let's add Vela for PRS. Let's go to add, there we go. Telecaster for Fender. Let's add Flying V for Gibson. And if we had a guitar that we have no idea who made it, we don't have to select any maker. We can add guitar and it still works. Now I should say, that refs are controversial. There are some people that say, no, you should not use refs at all. However, they do provide an actual use. Just be careful when you use them. If you need direct access to what is essentially the DOM object, really you're accessing the component itself, but when you need that level of access to automatically focus something or to select the text inside of a text area or a text box or anything like that, then refs make perfect sense. If you have a very, very, very large form, refs make sense. But if you don't need any of that functionality, if you have a relatively small form, I do recommend you use controlled inputs because it is the preferred way of working with forms. It's been a while since we've talked about CSS and really the only thing that we talked about was adding a CSS file to one of our JavaScript files using import and then that CSS file and that adds the CSS to our application and it is globally accessible. So all of the CSS rules inside of that file or files are accessible inside of all of our components. That's fine. However, there are some times when we might want a little finer control. Like for example, if we wanted to use inline styles. Now I know red flags are probably flying up in your head, inline styles, well that's evil. We've learned that we never use inline styles and yeah, but this is a different programming paradigm. We are in React and we have tools that pretty much negate anything that we have learned over the many years of web development. So if you're not familiar with the term inline styles, it's basically just using the style attribute. So let's just imagine that this li element is HTML. It has a style attribute where we would supply the CSS properties that we would want to apply to that element. So if we wanted to set the background color to red, then that is what we would do. If we wanted to set the foreground color, we would add that CSS property and its value. I mean, it's very straightforward. However, this is React. We are working with React elements and components. And this LI component doesn't have a style attribute. It has a style prop where we provide a JavaScript object that contains the CSS properties that we want to apply. So if you've ever written just plain vanilla JavaScript where you set the style, the inline style on an element using the style property and you have the camel cased CSS property name and then you assign it a value, that's essentially what we do inside of the object that we pass to the style prop. So in this case, if we wanted to have a background color of red, then it would look like that. Just normal JavaScript CSS stuff. And if we wanted to have a foreground color of blue, then we would just add another property to this object called color. Then we would supply the value blue. So let's apply style 
to this LI element based upon the guitar manufacturer. So let's create an object called Maker Styles. And the properties of this object are going to be the values of PRS, Fender, and Gibson so that we can match that with the maker that is being passed as one of the props. You know, it's that text prop. So for PRS, let's say that we will have a foreground color of gray and then a background color of yellow. It's going to look ugly, but I want something that is going to be a visual so that we can definitely see the difference between these things. So we have PRS, we have Fender, and then we have Gibson. So for Fender, let's set the foreground to red. Let's set the background to black. And then the Gibson is going to have white text on a blue background. Let's make it navy. I like navy better than blue. And we want to apply this to the LI element. Now, remember that some guitars aren't going to have a manufacturer. So we need to take that into account, but we could very easily do that. Uh, let's first of all, create a variable because since our property names in this maker styles is lowercase, we need to take the items text from our props. So let's just create a variable called maker, where if we have that text, we will then lowercase that text. So we will call to lowercase, just like that. So that's inside of our style prop. It will kind of do the same thing. So that if we have a value for maker, then we can use that as a property for our maker styles. So let's give that a try. Let's go to our browser. Let's say that we want to add a Vela and that's PRS. So there we go. We can see that we have a guitar with the styling for PRS. Uh, let's do a Telecaster, which is Fender, and we will add that. And we can see that that's working. But let's also say that we want to take these same styles and we want to apply it to the options in the drop down. So one of the ways that we could do that is, of course, to just copy and paste. That's horrible because then that's getting into the realm of why we don't use inline styles in just traditional HTML. What we can do is actually just create a JavaScript module that's going to contain these styles that we want to use. And then we can import those in whatever files that we need and we're good to go. So let's create a new file. We'll call this guitarstyles.js. And we are going to export our maker styles. In fact, let's just go ahead and let's copy that. Let's actually cut it out because we won't need it here because we are going to paste it right there. So we're going to export multiple things from this file. So if we wanted to do the same thing for the types of guitars, you know, we could have a guitar styles that we could export. And so that we can import either one of these or we can import both of those if we needed to. But for right now, we just need the maker styles. So we can import that maker styles and it's just a JavaScript module. So we have imported this stuff before and that is from the file of guitar styles. So that now instead of this maker, well, yeah, we still use that maker styles. So uh, we want to essentially do the same thing inside of the add item component. So let's import our maker styles inside of add item. And then we want to apply these styles to our options so that once again, we will have our style prop and we want the maker styles.prs for this option. Then let's just copy and paste, make the necessary changes so that we have Fender and then finally Gibson. So whenever we go to the browser now, uh, let's add the flying V. Whenever we click on the select box, we can see that the options are going to be styled the same way that the items in our list are styled based upon the manufacturer. Now, of course, yes, you can accomplish the same thing by creating a CSS file, putting in those same CSS classes, and you're good to go. But this is just another option that's available to you. So if you don't want to use CSS classes for whatever reason, you can use JavaScript. One of the benefits of using Create React app to create your project is that you get CSS module support out of the box. Now, if you're not familiar with CSS modules, 
Well, it's just CSS. There are some differences between a regular CSS file and a CSS module, but it is still CSS. Now, one of the big features is that you can scope your style to whatever file that you want to use those styles in. So whenever you import a CSS module, it is not globally available. It is only available inside of whatever component you import it into. So in this lesson, what I want to do is temporarily, mind you, change the text of the navbar brand. I want to make this bold and yellow and it's gonna be ugly, which is why it's gonna be temporary. So the first thing that we need is our CSS module. Now, the first part of the file name is not magic. Since this is going to primarily be used inside of the navbar component, I'm going to call it navbar. The magic part of this is that the end of the file name has to be module Dot CSS, because that is what is going to tell the compiler to handle this file differently than just a regular CSS file. So let's define a class that's going to have bold yellow text, and we can call it just bold yellow text. Now notice the style that I used for this class name. It's camel case. You will see why here in a moment. But let's set the font weight to bold. Let's set the color to yellow. And we better mark that as important because Bootstrap will probably override that. So we have this class name that we want to use inside of our navbar. So let's go ahead and let's import that. The big difference here is that we aren't just going to import that navbar.module.css. We are going to also import an object. So import styles from and then our file name. Now, styles is just convention. Probably in most projects, you will see styles used. So you can use whatever you want. The convention is typically styles. And we want to use that bold yellow text class for the class name for our navbar brand. So we're gonna start by just using a JavaScript expression, styles, this is an object. And we have a property called bold yellow text. So this is why I named that class name using camel case, because the classes that you define inside of a CSS module end up being JavaScript properties. So let's save this, go to the browser. We see bold yellow text for our navbar brand, but we also want to include the navbar brand styling. So we can use string concatenation so that we will have our navbar brand and then we will bring in the styles dot bold yellow text and in the browser we will see both of those classes being applied to that element now let's inspect this because whenever you use a css module and the classes are scoped the way that it becomes scoped is the name of the CSS class. It doesn't create a class just called bold yellow text. It is somewhat unique. Now we could take this CSS class and we could use that in other files, but why would we want to do that? If we wanted to use this in other files, then all we would need to do is import this file into wherever we wanted to use it. So let's say that we wanted to do this inside of app because we want to not just have the container, but we also want this to be bold and yellow. So we will add the styles and then bold yellow text. So it's not limited to any file. The only stipulation is that we have to import this module wherever we want to use it. And so there we have our bold yellow text. But let's say, that, okay, this is a style that we are going to use in multiple places throughout our application. It makes sense to make this global so that we don't have to import this file wherever we need to use it. Well, we can mark this as global by using a special command beforehand. It's colon global. And then we have our class definition. And this is going to generate an actual CSS class called bold yellow text. So we will be able to use this throughout our application wherever we need to without having to import the file. 
So let's actually back out those changes because that's easier. And then we can add bold yellow text. And whenever we go to the browser, we see that that is indeed what we get. But notice uh, we lost that styling for our nav bar brand. So because that class is global, we no longer access it through that styles object that we are importing. We simply specify the name of that class, bold yellow text. And that is going to solve that for us. Now, there's another feature that CSS modules have, and that is the ability to compose your classes based upon other classes. So let's say that that's great and all, but I'm lazy. I don't want to have to specify navbar brand space and then bold yellow text. I want a class that combines those two together. And we can do that inside of our module we're going to define another class. We'll just call it my navbar brand. And there's a special command called composes to where we can specify the classes that we want to use to compose our own class. So we want to use bold yellow text, but since this is global, we have to say from global. If it was a local class, then all we would have to say is just the class name. But that's not the case. This is global, so we have to specify global. But we also want to compose using the navbar brand class from Bootstrap. But here's the issue. We have to specify the file where this class is defined, and that is inside of node underscore modules slash bootstrap slash dist slash CSS bootstrap.min.css. That's a, a lot to type. So if you want to build your own classes using Bootstrap's classes, you would have to have a composes statement for every class that you want to use. So you can't have composes and then navbar brand space bold yellow text or anything like that. You use composes, you specify one class, and if it is not local to this file, you specify where it is coming from. So that can be rather tedious. But this is going to give us my navbar brand so that inside of navbar, we can get rid of these two classes and we can use our styles. Once again, we will say my navbar brand and we will end up with the same result visually. But if we take a look at the CSS class that is generated, it is now, well, it's different. So CSS modules are another way that you can add style to your project. It's especially useful if you want to scope style to certain components. And it also gives you the ability to define global classes as well as compose your own classes based upon other already existing classes. We write applications in order to work with data. And for the vast majority of those applications, the data resides well outside of the application. So that means we need to load it. We are loading it from web services, from local storage. I mean, there's a variety of ways that we can load data into our application. And sometimes it's not very obvious as to when we do that. So what I had originally planned was to load the guitar manufacturers for our add item component so that we could pull that data dynamically and then you know, our application would use it. But no. I want to do something completely different, something that's actually usable. So we are going to write a weather widget. We are going to fetch data from an actual web API and use that in a component that we can then just drop into any application. So it is going to be self-contained. In fact, the only thing it is going to be dependent upon is the location to retrieve the weather. That's going to be the prop. So it is going to have its own state. It's going to make its own HTTP requests. It's not going to be dependent upon anything else other than that location prop. So we are going to write two things in this lesson. The first is going to be the weather app, and we are going to use the weather app inside of index. So instead of using this app component, which is what we have been using, we are going to use this weather app. Let's go ahead and import that even though it doesn't exist just yet. And we are going to use it right here. So weather app. And the weather app itself 
is going to be a function, but it is going to have some state. So let's go ahead and import use state. We're also going to use a ref because we are going to have a form that the user can fill out for the location. Now we aren't going to use a controlled input because a controlled input is going to update state every time the user types into the text box. I don't want that. I want the state to change only when the form is submitted. So we are going to use a ref so that we can reference that input element. And whenever we click on the button, that will change our state. So let's call this weather app and let's go ahead and define our state. So that is going to be the location. Then we will have our function to set that location. And let's set this to an initial value of an empty string. And we can go ahead and create our ref now that I have told you why we are going to use a ref. And this is one of those reasons why we would want to use a ref. We want specific functionality that we can't get from a controlled input. So we're going to use a ref in this case. And then we are going to have our JSX. Now I'm going to paste this in because it's quite a bit of markup, but there's nothing really special about it. It's a div that contains a div that contains a div that has a form. The form has an input element and it has a button. So since we have this input element here, let's go ahead and set up the ref with that location input and then our button. Uh, we will write a function to handle the click event, which is going to update our state. And then there's this weather widget. We do need to export this. So let's export default weather app. Uh, this does not exist yet, but it will here in a second. So let's go ahead and import weather widget from, and that file is going to be weather widget class because we're going to write this as a class. We're also going to write it as a function because how you load data is different between those two different types of components. So let's go ahead and let's create that new file. We'll call it weather widget class. And let's go ahead and import component. I don't think we need really anything. I mean, we are going to have state, but this isn't going to accept any user input, at least as far as the UI is concerned, that is going to be supplied as a prop. So we should be fine with just importing component here. Then we'll call this weather widget and it is going to extend the component class. Let's go ahead and write the constructor where we are going to have our props and we're going to pass those on to our super class. And then let's export the weather widget so that we do not forget to do that. Let's also go ahead and define the render function. And for right now, let's just return a div element. I want to see what this is going to look like in the browser, make sure that the form looks okay. Uh, weather widget is not defined find it is except that we need to save that file so now we have our form that that's that's great now we are going to approach the development of this widget a little bit differently because the web api that i'm using is called weather stack they have a free subscription but you are limited to only 250 requests for the month so we need to be a little bit stingy with our requests and one of the ways that we can do that is by changing uh, inside of index. If we get rid of the React strict mode, because as we are developing our application while we are in strict mode, the render method on a class or the function component executes twice. I don't know if you've noticed that whenever we've had the console open but that is because we are in development using strict mode. If we were to build it for production and then run it, we wouldn't be seeing that behavior. But since we are limited on the amount of requests that we can make, we need to be a little stingy with those requests. So at first we aren't going to be making requests. We are going to set up our application to make those requests, but we're going to wait to actually send those requests so that we don't use our quota. Uh, so our button in our weather widget, let's set up the on click event. Uh, we'll call this handle click and let's go ahead and define that function so that whenever we click on this, the first thing we want to do is prevent the default action from occurring, which is submitting the form. And then we want to set 
our location to whatever was supplied here. So that is going to be our location inputs value. So we need current and then value. And as far as the app itself, that is essentially it because all of the work is going to be done inside of our weather widget. And as far as the app component itself, that's it. It's relatively straightforward. All it is doing is getting input from the user so that it can supply that to the widget. So in the next lesson, you will learn how and where to load data within a class. React is a framework for building user interfaces. That is its primary purpose. So the purpose of every component is to build a small piece of that user interface. And that's all well and good. However, as you are writing an application, that's really not feasible because an application is working with data. It's got to interact with that data by either pulling it from a web service or reading it from the browser's local storage. It also has to update that data by issuing other requests or saving it to local storage. There might be some logging that needs to occur. There might be some caching that has to be written. There's a lot of things that an application does other than just displaying the UI. So for all of these other processes that occur, we call those side effects. And a lot of our components are going to be working with those side effects. However, there are some good places to do that. There are some not so good places to do that. Like for example, the constructor. The constructor is for initializing the things that the class is going to need. Like for example, we need state for this because we need to store the weather data that's going to come from the web API. So initializing our state in the constructor makes a whole lot of sense. However, issuing the request to that web API inside of the constructor doesn't make a whole lot of sense, primarily because if you make a request, you might want to cancel that. And you can't necessarily do that inside of the constructor. So anything other than just straight up initialization is not really suited for the constructor. So then I want you to think about just a typical web page. You know, no frameworks, no nothing, just vanilla JavaScript and the tools provided by the browser. So a lot of times we want to do something after everything in the page has been loaded. So that's when the load event occurs within the browser. And inside of our components, we have something very similar. It's called component did mount. This is essentially the load event for our component. This means that the component is loaded in the browser. Everything is there, the DOM's there, and it's ready to do whatever it needs to do. So in this component did mount event, this is a great place to issue our request. Now we're not going to do that. We're going to simulate that for right now so that we don't work against our quota for the web API, but let's just write something to the console that says request made in component did mount. It's a bit verbose, but it's clear. Let's also write a message in the render method so that we know that render occurred. So let's go to the browser. Let's refresh the page. And we are going to see that render occurred. So that's what first happened. And then we can see that a request was made in component did mount. So it's great that a request was made because that's what we told it to do. However, what did it request? Because there was no information provided. We definitely didn't click on the get button. So the request was made for no location whatsoever. So really what we need to do inside of our component did mount is check to see if we have a location from our props. And if we don't, then we of course don't wanna do anything, but if we do, then we will issue that request. So let's save that, let's go back, let's refresh the page. We're going to see that it rendered, which is good, render occurred, but notice that the event didn't occur. We did not issue that request and that's really good. So if you have the React developer tools, let's go to the components tab. Let's take a look at the weather app and we can see that we have some state. There is nothing there, it's an empty string. We have our ref. And if we look at the weather widget, uh, the props, the location is an empty string. Okay, that's all well and good, that's as it should be. So we are going to request the weather for Dallas. So we click on get, we can see that the state for the weather app changed, that's Dallas. We can also see that the location prop is now Dallas. But if we look at the console, 
it rendered because the props that were sent to our weather widget component changed, so therefore rendering occurred, but notice that we didn't issue that request. That's because this component did mount. This is a one-time deal. This is when the component is mounted. So it's not going to execute every time it renders. It's only going to execute that one time when it is mounted. So in that case, we want to tap into another event called component did update. And this has two parameters. The first is the props that were in the component before it was updated. So it's called previous props. The second is the previous state. So if we need any information from before the component was updated, we have that information. Now I lied, there's actually a third, it's called snapshot because there is this component did update, but before this occurs, we could actually tap into another method that gives us a snapshot of that component before it has been updated in the DOM and, and everything like that. We aren't going to really worry about that because in our case, this is going to be sufficient for us. So essentially what we want to do is make sure that the location is different from the previous props to the current props. And the reason being is remember that we are limited on the amount of requests. So we need to put a governor in this thing so that we don't make a whole lot of requests. So if the location prop doesn't change, so if we type in Dallas and we click get 10 times, we don't want to issue 10 requests. We only want to issue one because there's no need to do those other nine well, because it's the same location. So what we're going to do here is use the previous props and we're going to check to see if the location is different than the newly provided location prop. And if it is, then we are going to log that the request was made or let's say request made in component did update. Now we could take this a step further and track the time of the last request so that if the location hasn't changed, but let's say that it's been more than a minute from the last request because you know the weather changes that fast, uh, then we could issue that request. And that would be relatively straightforward. We would need to track the state and the time and all of that stuff, but we're just gonna keep things a little simple here. All right, so let's take a look at this now. Let's refresh, and whenever this loads, we see that the render occurred. That's what we would want. If we click on the get, nothing happens because no data is changing at all. So let's provide Dallas for the location. We'll click on get, and we can see that the request was made in component did update. That's exactly what we wanted. If we click on get again, Nothing happens because the data is not changing. Let's change it again. And of course we see that a request was made. So this is the functionality that we are after. Now you might be asking yourself, that's great, but why did we do the component did mount? Because as it seems right now, we're not using that. But remember that we can supply a value for location just right out of the bat. Uh, let's go to the weather app and for our default value for the state, let's just put Dallas there so that whenever we refresh this, we're going to see that a request was made in component did mount. So the reason why we're doing it in component did mount and component did update is so that we can cover both of those bases. So that if we have a location at the very beginning, then we will go ahead and make that request. Otherwise, whenever the data changes, we will make our request then. So, as far as our class is concerned, I think we are good to go. We aren't going to proceed just yet with issuing our requests because in the next lesson, we need to look at how to do this same exact thing inside of a function component. In the previous lesson, we talked about side effects and where we want to do those effects because we don't want to just issue an HTTP request anywhere like the constructor is a very bad place to do that. We probably don't want to do that inside of render either. We do, however, want to issue a request when the user does something to initiate that, like clicking on a button, or if we want something a little more automated, then we want to use a lifecycle event, like the component did mount. 
which is essentially the load event for a component. And then there's the component did update, which, well, it executes when the component updates. So we want to replicate that same functionality inside of a function component. So let's go ahead and let's create that file. We'll call it weather widget function. And let's just copy what we have from the class and let's use that as the basis for our function because we it gives us quite a bit. So instead of importing components, we can import use state because we do need state. So we can go ahead and set that up. We called that data inside of the class. So we will have data and set data. And I believe we initialize that as null. Now, of course, we need to change this so that it is a function and we want our props. And I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to destructure our props so that we can get direct access to the location because that's what we are after for the most part. And that keeps us from having to type props.location all of the time. And then we have our render, which, well, that is essentially our function. So there we go, we have our function. So let's modify the weather app so that we are going to use our function instead of the class. Let's also change the default value here. Instead of Dallas, we will have an empty string. So that inside of the browser, looks like everything works. Let's refresh the page and we should see that the render occurred. So there we go. Whenever you want to use side effects inside of a function component, you have to hook into React. Just like we have to hook into React to use state. So we have a hook called use effect. And the first thing that we pass to use effect is a function that we want to execute. This is essentially the effect that we want. So what we want to do is make an HTTP request. So we will write to the console request made. Now remember that with a function component, the function is essentially the render method. So this function is going to execute for every update. So whenever we see this in the browser, our effect is going to execute every time. So just by loading, we see that render occurred and then request made. If we change the value of location, render occurred, request made. If we change it again, that same behavior is going on. So that kind of looks like the behavior that we want. In fact, really the only thing that we should be able to do is just check if we have a location. And if we do, then we will make the request. Otherwise we won't. And Oh, yeah, that could get us there. That could do more than get us there. That would get us there. However, I think that there is a better option because you can pass a second argument to use effect, which is an array of values that the effect is going to be dependent upon. And th that that's not really a good description. It's an array of values that could change. And if they do change, then we want the effect to execute. Now, if we pass in just an empty array, we essentially replicate the functionality of component did mount. So I'm, I'm getting rid of the check for location so that the first thing that happens whenever we reload the browser, we can see that the render occurred and the request was made. But if we change the location, the only thing that's going to happen is it will re-render the request is not made. So the effect that we wanted only executed when the component was loaded, which is essentially the component did mount. So if you need to replicate component did mount inside of a function component, you can use effect and then pass an empty array as the second argument. But that's not what we want. We want our effect to essentially occur every time that location changes. So we want location as a dependency here. And once again, we want to check if we have a location before we try to make a request. So with that little simple change, we should see the behavior that we want. So the first loading, the render occurs, there is no request made. If we have a location, the request is made. If the location changes, 
once again, the request is made. So this is what I would argue is what we need for our purposes, because we want this effect to occur when the location changes. Now, that means whenever we set data, you know, that is setting the state that is supposed to trigger React to re-render our component, which in the case of our function component, it will re-render it by executing this function. But since we have said that our effect is based upon the location, the effect is not going to execute. If we wanted it to execute when data changed, we would need to supply data as a dependency. So this is why I think that this is the better option, because if we don't supply any dependencies, it's going to execute every time, and we don't want that. So in a way, this is very much like what we did in the previous lesson inside of component did update, where we are checking if the previous props location is not equal to this props location. Because this component can update for a variety of reasons. It can update because we have changed the state, in which case we do not necessarily want to issue a request. We only want to issue a request when the location changes. So in the next lesson, we will implement the rest of our weather widget. We will make our request and we will display that information in the browser. Well, we are finally ready to finish our weather widgets. And we're going to start with the function component since we talked about that in the previous lesson. And I'm going to start with the markup so that we can get everything ready to display the data. And then we will make the actual request because we are limited on the amount of requests that we can make. So our div element is gonna have a class of card. So we are going to use the card from Bootstrap in order to organize this. That gives us the ability to display an image that is representative of the weather at whatever location we specify. And we are going to need another div for the card body because this is where we are going to have the title, which is going to be the location name. Now, you don't have to worry about the structure of the incoming data because I already know that. So we have the data that is our state. So that's going to be our entry point into this. It's gonna be a little bit of typing, but for the name, it's gonna have a property of data.location and then name. And then outside of the body, we are going to have an unordered list, but we are going to make this a list group. And we're going to display just some information about the weather at this current location. Like for example, we will have the temperature, that's kind of important. So let's just copy this and paste it a few times. So we will have the temperature, which is going to be data.current and then temperature. And there's also going to be a description. There could be multiple descriptions, but we just want one. And it's going to give us just the, the basic information, like if it's cloudy or partly cloudy or sunny or things like that. So that is also inside of current. And there's a property called weather descriptions. This is an array and we are just going to pick the first item out of that array. We also want the wind speed because wind is important. That's also in the current section of this object and wind speed uses the underscore naming style as does the wind direction, because it's not good enough to just know what the wind speed is. You kind of need to know in which direction it's going. And then finally, the humidity. I used to not care about humidity, but then I lived in the Houston area. And um, yeah, I went from a very dry area to a very humid area and I care about humidity now. So that's the information that we are going to display. And of course, if we were to view this inside of the browser, it would not work. In fact, we probably have an error. Yeah, we do, because none of this stuff exists yet. Although, let's see here, undetermined regular expression. Uh, we need to close out that so that we have a closing curly brace. All right, so we have everything ready to display. Although, one thing we should do, uh, let's get rid of this console log. And let's do this. If we don't have data, 
then that means it's still going to try to display some of this information and we could run into errors. So if we don't have any data, then let's just display nothing. And that's gonna be just fine. All right, so now it is time to make our request. So you can use any HTTP library that you want. I like fetch, it's easy enough to use. And I'm going to paste in the URL that we are going to be using. So we are going to hit the weather stack API. We want the current because that's one of the few things that we have access to as a free subscription. So this is going to give us the current temperature at whatever uh, location we specify. And I'm using Fahrenheit for my units because I'm in the US. And of course you need an access key. So if you want to follow along and build this yourself, you will need to sign up for a free subscription to get your access key. There is this access key that you see on screen. That's gonna change. So uh, it's not good enough, however, to make our request. We then want to do something with the response, and that is to convert it from the JSON structure into a JavaScript object. And then we will take that JavaScript object and we will set our data passing in object. So there we go, that is our widget. That should work. Let's save it, let's go to the browser. Uh, looks like we have some errors, but let's just refresh and let's see if those errors go away. Looks like they do. All right, so let's get the temperature. Uh, you can put in whatever you want. I'm going to do Dallas. And oh, we need the image, don't we? Yes. So. Our image is going to come from the WeatherStack API. So we are going to set the source of this image to data current weather icons. And there may be more than one. There's always going to be one. So we are going to use that first one. So now with that in place, we can see that it looks like it's a clear night. Uh, the temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, wind is four miles per hour out of the northeast and the humidity is 42. That's high, but it's not going to be as high as Houston. So if we take a look at Houston, temperature is 75. It is overcast, which yeah. And the wind is six miles per hour, east, southeast, humidity 88. I'm glad I am not there. All right, so that is our function component. We have this widget. So we could, if we wanted to, we could take this code, we could lift it out, put it in any application and it would work. The only thing that we would need to supply is the location. So it is completely and totally on its own. So let's go to the weather app. Let's change this so that we are going to use our class. And there's gonna be a lot of copying and pasting. So let's take starting from the if check for data all the way down to the end of the return statement. And we're going to use that inside of our render. And to make this a little bit easier, what we'll do is create a data variable to where we will set that equal to the data from our state. That way we don't have to change anything as far as the output is concerned. But then we have the code for the component did mount and component did update. Now, we essentially want to do the same things here. We want to issue a request for whatever our location is. So it would make sense to define a method. Let's just call this fetch data. We don't need our location because our location is provided through our props. So we can essentially take the same code of whenever we fetch information and paste that inside of fetch data. We do need to change where we use the location that is coming from our props now. And instead of calling set data, we want to call set state. And we want to update our data. And I'm gonna do this to make it easier. So that all we have to do is say that we want to set our state and the data there. So that should be fine except that we need to call this fetch data inside of component did mount. We need to do the same thing for component did update. So that should be it. Let's save it. Let's go back. 
it should automatically reload with whatever data that we had there. So let's do something else. Let's do San Antonio. I love San Antonio. So let's get that. We can see that it automatically updated for us. Temperature 75, partly cloudy. Wind is eight out of the Southeast. Humidity is 82. I believe that. I love San Antonio. I do not love the humidity there. And let's try New York just to see what that is going to look like. New York is clear. Temp is 52. That sounds nice. Wind four miles per hour Southeast humidity 48. That does not sound nice. So there we go. We have a working widget. We have it both as a function. We also have it as a class, whichever way that we want to go. After looking at the code, I would say that the function is a bit more clean and clear as to what is going on, but either approach gets the job done. And it's not dependent upon anything except that location, which makes it very nice and very portable. So far, everything that we have done, every example has been just a single screen in a single page. And there are many applications that are built that way. An application could have multiple pages and on each one of those pages would be just a single component to do whatever that page needs. And that's perfectly fine. However, there are many applications that are kind of the reverse to where there's a single page, but the application running on that page has multiple screens so that you can navigate between those different screens. And the best thing is that the page isn't reloaded. You're not navigating to other pages. We typically refer to these as single page applications. And React was essentially designed for building single page applications. But in order to have this functionality, the first thing we need is called a router. And there are many different routers for React. The one that we want, is called React Router DOM. This is the router that runs within the web browser. There is a router for native applications. There's a router for server-side applications that run on Node. And there are other routers as well. But as I said, for our purposes, we want React Router DOM. Now, I should say, this is not part of React. This is a third-party library. However, when it comes to building single page applications, this is what we use and it is very commonly used. So we want to save this as a dependency. Now you might be thinking, what exactly is a router? Well, basically it takes a URL and routes that to a component. And this is a very common thing, especially on server side frameworks where you would have a URL that's incoming to the application the application would then decide what code is going to handle that URL. So it routes the URL to the code that's going to handle it. So in our case, that code is just a React component. So I want to make a few changes to our project because we're going to be creating a lot more files. I kind of want to keep everything together. So I want to take all of our existing code and I want to put it inside of a folder. We can call that folder whatever we want. I'm gonna call it old stuff, but there are some things that we want. Like for example, we do want the index file. We want the nav bar because it would be nice to have all of that ready to go for us. So I am going to copy all of those files so that the stuff that we have right now is not going to be changed. It's just going to be in a different place. Then I'm going to delete everything that we aren't going to need. So we need index.js and CSS. We need navbar. We don't necessarily need the navbar module. So we'll just leave that alone and we'll get rid of everything else. So inside of index.js, we need to do a lot of cleanup. Now inside of index.js, we're gonna need to make quite a few changes. First of all, we need to get rid of all of the code that referenced any of our old components. So that was the app and weather app components. We also need to get rid of the weather app element. Now I'm going to keep the strict mode commented out because we are going to make HTTP requests, not for weather stack, but we're going to hit a news API which still does limit us, but we have a much better limitation. I think it's a thousand requests a day. So that should be ample, but still I want to be safe. And so in order to use the router, we essentially need three things. 
The first is the router itself, which for our purposes, we need the browser router, except that traditionally what we do is it doesn't matter what router we use, we want to call it just simply router. So we're going to import the browser router as router. Then we also need the routes component because a router has routes and those routes have individual route. So we need those three things. And then whenever we render our application, we are going to start with the router. So then we will define the routes and then we define the individual routes. So the first route that we will write is going to have a path prop. This is the URL. So this is what is going to be inside of the address bar within the browser. So a slash just indicates home. It's the root of our application. So basically what we see here, localhost 3000. So we're gonna have a slash for our path. And then we get to specify the component that is going to handle that path. And in this case, let's say that we're gonna have a home component. So that's going to be our starting route. And if we're going to have any kind of navigation between the components, it kind of makes sense to have a second one. And so we'll call this one just React. And so the path for this is going to be React. The idea being that this is going to display our React news. And so let's create the home component. So we'll just call it home. And I'm getting a little lazy. So I'm going to say export default function home instead of defining the function and then exporting it. This is what I typically do. And we want to return our nav bar, which we need to import. And then we will have some content that just signifies that this is the home page, which I think we had a div with a class of container, and then we will just have an H5 that will have a title like homepage, something like that. Uh, we do need to import navbar, so let's go ahead and do that. And let's copy this, and let's paste it into a new file, which we will call React News. And of course, we need to change the name of the function to React News. Let's change the text to React News Page. And then we need to import these inside of index.js. So let's do that. But then we also need links. We need a link so that we can click to navigate between these two components. So it makes sense to me to put that inside of navbar because that is after all what its purpose is. So after the navbar brand, we will have a UL element with a class name of, well, there's, going to be several. So I'm just going to paste them in. And then we will have individual LI elements. I have a class name of nav item, and then we need to have a link. Now the links are not just your typical A elements. Instead, what we need to use is a link component from React Router. So let's import link from React Router DOM and we will simply add the links to those components. So the first is going to have a to prop. This is where we want to go to, which is going to be the home component. Now bootstraps nav as a class name of nav link, and then we will just have the text of home. And then we will just copy this and paste it for the React news. We just need to make the necessary changes. I believe we specified that the URL was gonna be React, and it is. And then the text will just say React News. So with all of those changes, we should be able to go to the browser and we get an error. And that's because those things were exported as default. Okay, so now we should see our page. We have our nav bar. We are at the home page. If we click on React News, it should navigate us to React News. Now notice that the URL is different, but there was not an HTTP request. This was done just through JavaScript. And the great thing is we didn't have to write the code to make all of that work. React Router is making that magically happen. Of course, we had to set up the router, but that's easy compared to this type of navigation. So that's great. Let's add another page. This will be for JavaScript news. The component will be JavaScript news. And we of course need that file as well, but we are just going to copy one of the existing files and use that. So let's copy react news. 
We'll create a new file called JavaScript news.js, paste this in, make the necessary changes. And we do need another link for this item as well. So we need to go to the nav bar. Let's copy one of the links, paste it. We'll make the necessary changes and we will have a third page. Now, as you've probably noticed, each one of these components that are representing individual pages have all of the same markup. They include the nav bar. They include the content. That's not really great because that means if we want to keep this same look and feel, we need to go into each one of these components and we need to modify whatever it is that we need to modify. Thankfully, React Router lets us define what is essentially a layout component or a layout route so that we can define the layout of our application and all of the other components essentially inherit that layout. And we will look at that in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to React Router, which enables us to build single page applications. So here we have a single page loaded into the browser. And whenever we click on these links, we're not navigating to another page. These are React components that are dynamically loaded. And React Router makes all of this possible. And the best thing is everything looks and feels the same, <laughs> except that the reason why is because they all have essentially the same markup. They all reference the nav bar. They all have the same div for the content container. And that makes maintenance a nightmare because if we need to make any cosmetic change to one of these, then we essentially need to replicate that change in all of the other components. That's a nightmare. We are human and we will mess something up. So thankfully we can create what's called a layout route, which allows us to essentially define a component that has our layout, which in our case is the nav bar and then the div container for our content. And then the content itself can be inside of the home react and JavaScript components. So the first thing we are going to do is create a layout component. We'll just call it layout.js. There is no magic in this name. And since any one of these components has our layout, I'm just going to copy and then paste into layout. And all we need to do is take out our content. But the React router needs to know where to inject our content in our layout. And we do that with a component called outlet. So we need to import outlet. This is from React Router DOM. And all we have to do is use outlet. That's it. At least as far as the layout is concerned, we do need to go to our index because that is where our routes are defined. And we need to add that layout route. We do so as a normal route. So we're going to use the route component. We don't need to specify a path. We can and we will look at that here in a moment. But for right now, all we need is the element prop and we want to specify the layout element. Now we do need to import this, but essentially this is going to serve as the parent route for our home React and JavaScript routes. So it allows us to nest our routes. So you can essentially think of it as these content routes for home React and JavaScript are inheriting the layout route. I mean, that, I guess that's one way that you could look at it. Let's import the layout component so that we don't run into any errors. And then finally, we need to go to the other components and we need to get rid of everything that we don't need. So that is the nav bar, that is the div element for our content. And once we get that done and we view this in the browser, we are going to see essentially the same thing, but our application is going to be a lot easier to maintain. So with these final edits, we will save the file. Let's go to the browser. And there we go. We can navigate to these individual components just like we did before and everything looks good. Now I want to add some margin to the top of our content and all we have to do is make that change inside of our layout. So we'll use the MT3 class from Bootstrap that's going to push our content down just a little bit and one change is now reflected in all of those components. Now, one of the really cool things about layouts is that we can use as many layouts as we want. Like for example, we have our layout for home 
React and JavaScript, but let's say that our application has an admin section so that we can manage the different topics that we want to view. And of course, an admin section is going to look very different from what the front end of our application is going to look like. So we could define another layout for the admin section and only the admin section by just defining that layout route. And then the children of that route would be for the admin section. But even then you can nest a layout inside of a layout. Like for example, with our application, we have the home page and that's great. But we also have these React and JavaScript news, which I think are kind of a different section, at least as far as the URL is concerned. Like, for example, if we're going to view a news topic, I would think that the URL would be news slash and then whatever topic that we were wanting, like React, JavaScript or whatever else. So home would still be the root of our application. Everything else would be news. Well, that's easy enough to do. All we have to do is just add another route that is a child of our layout. But the path in this case, we'll say is going to be news. And then we will put the React and JavaScript routes inside of this news route. We need to get rid of the slashes in front, but this is essentially going to create routes so that news slash React and news slash JavaScript are going to work. Uh, let's change our nav bar so that the links reflect that so that we will have news in front of react and JavaScript so that now we can navigate. The URL is now what we would expect. We have news as the first segment and then our news topic, but we could also define a layout. Let's create a new file. We'll call this news layout. Let's copy the contents of our layout component because we need that outlet, but we don't really need anything else. But to prove that this is going to use the news layout, we will just say news layout. Then we will have our content. We need to import this inside of our index so that we can use it in our routes. And we will use this as the element for our news route. So now whenever we go to any of the news routes, we will see the news layout because we added that as part of the news layout. So for JavaScript and React, we see that. If we go to home, that's not going to be there. All we see is homepage. So we are using essentially two layouts together in order to be able to show different content based upon the URL. Let's get rid of that news layout because, well, we don't need that. So the next thing that we are going to talk about are route parameters, because it's great that we have React news and we have JavaScript news, but if we wanted to add any other news topics, we would have to create a component for that topic so that we could, of course, navigate to that component and view the news. But since our topic is actually part of the URL, we can make the news dynamic so that we would have just one component for fetching and displaying the news information. And it would dynamically load the appropriate content based upon that segment in the URL. And you will learn about route parameters in the next lesson. I've said it many times in this course, but rewrite software to work with data. And that data controls how our application looks. Like for example, we have three links, home, React news, and JavaScript news. Now, I don't really care about home, but the two links for displaying news results, they essentially do the same thing. The topic is, of course, going to be different, but the type of data will be the same. So in my mind, it really doesn't make sense to have two components that do the same thing. It would be nice to have just one component, and then the results that we see will be based upon the topic in the URL because we have the topic as the second segment in the URL. So I want to be able to grab that value so that then we know what type of news that we want to retrieve. But then I also want to take it a step further because as it is right now, if we want to add another topic, we have to create another component, we have to create another route, and then we have to add a link to the nav bar. I want this to be completely soft coded so that we can have just an array of topics. And based upon that array, the application is going to automatically populate the nav bar 
And then whatever we use to display our news results will, well, it will display the news results based upon that topic. So first things first, we need to know how to get the values from our URLs. So this is going to be dynamic. And whenever you have anything in the URL that's going to be dynamic, you want to use what's called a route parameter. So for example, our news route, we could have a route parameter as the second segment. You start a route parameter with a colon followed by a valid JavaScript identifier. So this could be news topics or just news topic. And then this is essentially going to be a value that we can pick out and we can use within our component. But you're not limited to just URL segments. If you wanted to use a route parameter within the query string, you could do that as well. All you have to do is just define another route parameter. So you can have as many route parameters as you want in your URL, as long as the router can match the URL with a given route. Now, for our purposes, I don't want to use the route parameter here inside of the news route. I'm going to change one of our existing routes inside so that it is simply going to be, uh, we'll call this news topic. And instead of React News, we will have another component called News Results. And that of course means that we need to create that file. So let's create the file. Let's go ahead and import this here so that I don't forget to do that later because I will, uh, that always happens. And to start, all we need is just a copy of React News or JavaScript News. So I'm just going to grab React News because that's what my eyes went to first. We'll paste that inside of News Results. So inside of this component is where we will get the value of that URL parameter. But to do that, we need a hook. And so we are going to import a hook called use params. This is from React Router DOM, and it's just a function that is going to give us an object where the properties are the URL parameter names in this route. So this is going to give us an object. Uh, let's call that object simply params. We'll call use params and we will have a property called news topic. So let's output that so that we can see it in the browser. And so no matter what we do as far as the URL, if we go to news slash react, we see react. If we go to JavaScript, we see JavaScript. If we go to cars, we see cars. So that is working well. What I want to do now is automatically build our nav bar. The first thing I want to do is change a bad decision on my part. The layout component that we created, I wanted to rename that as app because that is essentially what this is. This is our app component. So I'm gonna change it. Uh, layout was good for the example of layout, but ultimately this is our app component. And what I'm about to do inside of this is going to make sense as to why I want to change it. Because here I'm going to define the array of our topics. So I'm just gonna call it topics. We want React, we want JavaScript, and I guess let's make this look like how we want to view it. So it's going to be React, but let's do this. Let's say React JS, because if we have a news topic of just React, we're gonna get a lot of stuff. And then we will pass those topics onto the nav bar. We'll just call this prop topics. And so inside of nav bar, we then need to generate the LI elements for our nav items as well as the links inside of them. So let's destructure our props so that we have our topics and let's generate those elements. We'll call this list items and we want to map over our topics so that we have the item. We're also going to get the index because there's one thing that I've neglected to tell you about creating a collection of things. I'm sure you have seen the error inside of the console, but we're gonna fix that here. So we want to create an LI element with a class name of nav item. And then we want to create a link element where two is going to be a string to where we will say news slash, and then we will have the item which is going to be the topic. We want to set the class name 
to nav link. And then we want the text of the topic, which is our item variable. And then once we have those list items, we want to display those in the nav bar. So let's do that. So we will have our list items. Let's go back to the browser. Uh, we have an air props is not defined. That is inside of navbar JS. Uh, where did we use props? Oh yeah. So we need title and we need topics. Although we haven't used title in this case. Uh, let's see where else. And we're still using props somewhere. So I don't see props. Where is, oh <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now there we go. Our nav bar is automatically generated with our topics. We click on these, we see the topic and let's pull up the console so that we can look at the error that I know is there. It says each child in a list should have a unique key prop. So essentially what we need to do is add a key prop to each one of these LI elements that we create. And the value needs to be unique for this particular collection, which in our case is the index. I typically call that II, but let's do this. Let's call it index so that that's clear as to what that is. So by providing the index, that error is going to go away. We have the functionality that we want where our nav bar is dynamically loaded based upon our topics. And then we are using a single component for displaying the news for those topics. So now in the next lesson, all we need to do is add that functionality so that we make a request to the news API for our given topic so that we can display that in our component. Our little news application is ready for us to make a request and display the results in the browser. But first of all, we need a news source and we have one with newsapi.org. Now they do have paid subscriptions, but they also have a freebie where you get 100 requests per day, which is a much better quota than Weatherstack. However, we still need to be careful because if we do things wrong, if we set up our component incorrectly and we are making requests, we could reach that quota within just two seconds. So uh, the last thing that we are going to add code wise is going to be the HTTP request that we make. So just keep that in mind. You will have to set up an account so that you can get an API key, but that's it. It's very straightforward to use. All right, so because we are going to be making a request and we want to do something with that response, we need to store that response in state. We also need to work with side effects because we are going to make an HTTP request. So we need to import use state and use effect. Let's go ahead and set up our state. Let's call the variable results and our function set results. And we will initialize this as an empty object. That way we always has something to work with, even if there are no properties. And next let's talk about our effect. All right. So let's first of all, write a message to the console saying that the component is loaded because whenever you start dealing with components that are loaded through the router, things can behave a little bit differently than what you would expect. So let's go to the browser. Let's pull up the developer tools and we will see loaded already. The reason being because we are on react JS and that makes perfect sense. If we navigate to JavaScript, we see loaded once again, if we go to react JS, of course we see loaded. If we go to home, we don't because that code isn't there. But every time we go to either react or JavaScript, we see loaded being added to the console. Okay. That's kind of what we are after, but let's throw in state because every time we make a request and that request is successful, we are going to change our state. So let's set the results to an object that has a property of X with a string value of Y. And this is why we are not making requests right now. Let's go to the browser and we can see we would have already reached that quota very quickly. So we are in an infinite loop right now. And um, let's see if I can stop that quickly. If we wait too long, the browser will become unresponsive. We'll have to close the tab. And yeah, looks like we've reached that point, which is fine. So let's just copy the URL. Let's paste it in. Let's close the old tab and we'll talk about what happened there. So remember that this is a function component. So this function react news 
is going to execute every time that the component re-renders. Well, it's going to re-render every time we change the state. So the function executes, the side effect function executes, we change the state, that forces React to re-render, which means it executes React News, it executes the effect, it changes the state. So we get into this infinite loop and we never get out of it. So then what happens if we emulate the component did mount functionality? So we're passing an empty array as the second argument to use effect. Let's pull up the developer tools. This is going to get us a little closer, but this is where things might behave a little bit differently than what you would expect. So we are on React right now. We of course see loaded in the console. If we click on JavaScript, a new loaded is not added to the log. If we click on React, once again, nothing is being added to the log. However, if we go to home, then we go to React, we see loaded. If we go to home and then JavaScript, we see loaded was added again. The reason is because remember that for our news results, that is a single component. And so as long as we click on a link that has a route to that component, it is already loaded. So there's no reason for that effect to execute again, unless if that component is unloaded by going to home. So that whenever we click on React or JavaScript, that has to load the news results component again, which is why we see it added to the console. So this is close, but there's still some room for improvement because we want to see loaded whenever we navigate between React.js and JavaScript. Well, remember that this array is the dependencies for our effect so that if the dependencies change, then the effect is going to execute again. Well, our dependency is basically the URL. It's the second segment. And we know what that is because that is our route parameter. So let's do this. Let's destructure this params so that we have news topic. And then we can use that as a dependency for our effect so that then the effect is going to execute now whenever our route parameter changes. So we click on React, it loaded. We click on JavaScript, it loaded. Go back to React, go back to JavaScript. We can see that it is now being added to the console. We go to home, it's not. We go back to React, it is. So this is the functionality that we want for making our requests. So now let's go ahead and let's make our requests because before we can display this in the browser, we do need data to work with. So I'm going to use fetch and I'm going to paste in the majority of this URL. We're going to use newsapi.org version two. They have this everything endpoint, which well, it gives us everything. And the query is going to be our news topic. We're going to sort by popularity and then the API key. So from there, we need to work with the response. So we will get the response, convert that into a JavaScript object with the JSON method. And then that is going to give us an object that we can use to generate our items. And what we need to do here is basically just set our results to this object so that we can work with that outside of our effect. And let's initialize the variable called output. And we'll just have this be empty so that if for whatever reason we don't have any news items to display, then we'll just display nothing at all. So let's use a property on our results. We want to make sure that everything is okay. There is this status property, and we will check to see if it is okay. If it is, then we will go ahead and generate our results so that we will change the value of output based upon our results. This has a property called articles that we will map over. And then we will work with the individual article as well as the index. And I'm going to paste in the markup. We're going to use the bootstrap cards once again, because well, it just makes things a little bit nicer to see inside of the browser. And there's nothing really special. We have the card body, we have the title, which is going to be the article title. So we will use that. This subtitle is going to be the author. So there's this author property on the article. 
and then we will display some of the content. Now, this isn't the full content because the API doesn't give us the full content of the article. It's going to give us a little blurb and then tell us how many characters are left. But then finally, we also need a link to take us to the article if there's actually something that we want to read. So we want to use the URL property on the article. And so that is going to give us the output, although we do need the key prop, which we will set to index. And then we will output our output. Let's put this inside of a div underneath the title for our news topic. And we will output that there. So whenever we go to the browser, we see that there's an error results uh, on line 19. So let's take a look and right there, that should be results. Let's go back and there we have some results. This is for React.js, and we can click on any one of these. Uh, let's go to the one on Neowin. Was this it? Yes. Uh, this was automatically set to open up a new tab. So that's nice. And there we have that article. So let's close that. Let's go to the JavaScript news. The results change. This looks interesting. Why would JavaScript pull up something on cryptocurrency? But uh, there we have that article on Slashdot. And if we wanted to add another topic, let's do that. Let's go to the, uh, that was inside of app, wasn't it? We had that array. So let's add guitar. And whenever we go back to the application, we will see guitar in our nav bar. Let's click it. Then we will see the articles for guitar. React unquestionably changed the way that we build web applications. Yeah, Angular started us down this path, but React made it so much more approachable. And it's my hope that as I leave you, that you have the fundamental understanding of how to effectively use React to build applications. Of course, I know you'll have questions. We all did and still do. So when you inevitably hit that first roadblock, I recommend hitting the React documentation at reactjs.org. React is well-documented, and it is the source of truth when it comes to how React works. And naturally, you can also head over to Tuts Plus, where there are lots of articles, tutorials, and courses just waiting for you. And we are already willing and able to help and answer your questions. Thank you so much for watching this course. Please feel free to contact me through Twitter or the Tuts Plus forums if you have any questions. From all of us here at Tuts Plus, thank you, and I will see you next time.